trees out there. Uh -oh. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here on We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. We're going to talk about Iran tonight. We're going to answer your questions. We have a whole list of questions from listeners. If you don't know what's going on in Iran, you're going to walk away understanding it from a bunch of different angles. And we will start that right after this message. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome, 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 everybody. It is great to be here this evening. Uh, my name is Chris Spangle, as the man said. And joining me is our good friend, Reinhold. We'll start with Reinhold, because he looked normal. Uh, still well, in his sexy lighting, which you can see on YouTube. Uh, as, you, as normal you as you can record be, this, I guess. You can watch it on YouTube, put it up on your TV, and uh, stream it live. Uh, Reinhold looks normal in his nice lighting. How are you, Reinhold? I'm doing well. It's uh, been a fun day and a long day, but um, doing good. Feeling better. You're telling me. Uh, looking good, Reinhold. Feeling good, Spangle. Feeling good. And then there's Harry, Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good, going good. G playing what? with some, the new stuff from uh, the Steam sale. Okay. What is the, is this a waifu? Yeah, yeah, you could call it a wa waifu. Isn't it cool? I like the breast size that you have now. It's it's much better than before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I bring, I try to bring the eye candy. You know, for the thousands of auditory listeners, Harry, on uh, we're recording over Zoom. Uh, it's uh, listen. Here's the reality of the show. It is better when we're in person. We can see each other, but uh, it's it's. You know, when it's dark out in the wintertime, especially, it's just hard to drive, you know, for Reinhold, 45 minutes, Harry, 30 minutes and traffic at six o'clock and you're tired from a full work day. And it's just sometimes it's it's nice to just zoom. So we're doing that, that a little bit more. And so you get the more close up faces. But that has allowed Harry uh, to apparently put up some sort of character long blue hair thin asian looking face elven ears and uh triple g breasts uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't see harry at all i just see some lady talking isn't it cool all right but here's the thing this is a serious show this is a professional show mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where we're going to be explaining iran to a lot of people who are very curious about it so we can't have tomfoolery so i'm gonna need you to change that back please Okay. All right. Thank you. This is taking very long. <laughs> I, was, I was going to We're do waiting a pregnant, for the sad face. Well, I was going to do a pregnant pause, and then when I saw Harry's face, scream in horror and say, change it back, because that's comedy. <laughs> 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 taking way too long. So that's why there was a pause. There's people driving going, did my thing just shut off? <laughs> um, uh oh, look like it messed up trying to switch back. I am, uh, if you are in the Bay Area, I will be in San Francisco on Thursday. I leave tomorrow evening and fly to San Francisco for the first time in my life. Uh, and I will avoid poop jokes here. I know that because uh, I'm inviting you to something. I will be doing a Pat Down podcast live at Cobb Comedy Club Thursday night, the 9th of January, 2020. Uh, so go to Sketchfest, San Francisco Sketch. Yeah. SF Sketch Fest to, to get tickets. So if you're in the Bay Area, come out and meet me. Say hi. Uh, I got invited to go tour Patreon's headquarters. They saw that I was coming out there and sent me a note and invited me to go to uh, Patreon's headquarters. So that's exciting. I might stop by and say hi and 
ask them why they ban libertarians and, and get in their face about it. Just, you know, regret that they invited me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm excited for the flight. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, looking at raising a little money. So I have an opportunity. There's this guy named Brendan Goodcuff. And look up Goodcuff Designs. He's a libertarian and a uh, really great guy. Talked to him for the first time, newly converted to libertarianism. A fantastic graphic designer who is right in the wheelhouse. And uh, I've been thinking for a while that I want to redesign not just the We Are Libertarians logo and the podcast art, but like everything, make it one cohesive brand. And, uh, you know, he's giving me a very fair price. And I'm looking at raising around fifteen hundred dollars, uh, maybe a little bit more. And uh, so, if you're if you're willing, I, I, I'm I'm saying this because I'm taking your temperature. So, if you'd be willing to pledge a little bit towards that, please send me a private message. Uh, send me a message and and let me know if you you'd be willing to to pitch in for that. The reason being that 2020 listenership, like here, here's how I put it: from 2012, which was our first presidential cycle we grew from 72 from zero to 72 in 2012 and then by 2016 we were at about 2500 downloads an episode it, the re, by the end of the 2016 election cycle we were up to 10,000 so we went from 2500 to 10,000 people in a single year so it's it's a massive growth opportunity. Just people are hitting it. You think about your own journey to libertarianism. You often become libertarian or start looking into the ideas in a presidential cycle. And the people who have the best graphic design get the most attention, and we are the best for newbies. And so I'd really like to do this project, but it's just out of my reach in terms of our Patreon and our monthly our monthly costs. And so I'm looking to raise about 1500 bucks. Uh, for that, to catch people's eyes, to look as professional as possible, much more professional than Harry makes us sound. Uh, so if you're willing and you're able, then please hit me up. I'd love to, uh, to, to be able to do that, but I can only do it if I have your support. So uh, let me know. And, and if next episode, if I get enough response, next episode, we'll start uh, the, we'll call it a money bomb. That's what we'll do. Um, but I want to thank our regular patrons, $100 a month patrons, the people who so generously give to this show every month. Craig DaCosta, Christy Avery, who uh, I won't reveal her pledge towards the graphic design project, but it's a third of it. It's a lot. Uh, Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, Matthew Durbin, and Ed Brehob, you guys keep this show going. And uh, this show is incredibly important to many different people. Uh, I got a great note, if you'll indulge me, fellas, while I look this up. Um, she wrote a really nice note. Uh, let's see here. Now, you may remember uh, the episode I did. I'd love to do this again, so another thing that you can hit me up if you're interested. Um, I had Miranda on to ask some basic questions. If you're out there and you're like, I've got questions about libertarianism and politics, and I don't know who to ask. I, I'm embarrassed to ask these questions. Um, I'd, I'd love for you to come on the show. Send me an email, editor at wearelibertarians.com. Uh, and Miranda came on and asked several questions, and uh, she sent me a great note. She's also a patron, and it said, it's definitely still having an impact uh, listening to this show. I still have friends and family telling me they listened to the episode I was on and that some of those things they hadn't thought of. I've been more and more I've had more and more conversations with people about government intervention and how it affects people. It's just been a snowball effect for the last year and I pay a great deal to Wall for that mindset. So we're out there helping people sound smarter when they're talking to their friends and family and hopefully this episode will do that as well. Um, now there are certain episodes where I go into it feeling like thank goodness for Sam Schultz because I was able to barely read the notes before we sat down, listen to a few podcasts, kind of get my bearings. And, you know, it's, it's thank goodness for great researchers like him. Um, we'd love to have more people on the research team too. There's plenty of ways to get involved here at We Are Libertarians. Um, and then there's episodes like this where I feel like Rocky training for Apollo Creed. Harry, I have been, I probably have read or spent reading, listening, reading articles, probably about 50 hours on this episode. <laughs> like I've just been, 
I fell so far down this rabbit hole on Iran and what's going on there uh, that I've overwhelmed myself with information. Have either of you seen the Married with Children episode where Kelly Bundy is training for a trivia show and they, they fill her head with too many facts? And so for every new fact she learns, one fact gets pushed out. And uh, the, the cliffhanger is that she, the winning fact is who scored four touchdowns in a, high school, in a high school football game. And it was Al Bundy, her dad, but she had forgotten the fact because it had pushed out. That's sort of what's happened here. And I wasn't <laughs> sure how to structure this show. Um, and so I solicited questions and I felt like, okay, this is, there is a ton of information here. There's a lot going on here. If you look at our show notes, it's uh, did I, Dennis? Did you? Or excuse me, Reinhold? Did you see the, the notes? I, I did see the notes. I looked through them. They're extensive. How um, categorized for well? How screeching long are those notes? Like they're not <laughs> even notes. They're just links. It's links to hundreds of articles, and books mm. and Twitter threads and. Yeah, the first two pages are books, <laughs> that you can read. Right. So and then there's a page and a half of Wikipedia articles. Yeah. Um, so it's just a lot of dense information and, and some yeah. of the things um, could be added to that list too, that I saw. So it's not, you know, Send it to me, I'll add them. I, I will get them added, but yeah, it's a, it's a good list to get started on at least if you really want to dive deep into what's going on, because it really looks like this is not going to be something that's just going to go away. Like a lot of Trump supporters thought it was going to, since we have the latest news coming through, which has now been confirmed by the Pentagon that uh, 12 missiles have hit U.S. bases in Iraq. Yes, this happened in the last hour. I saw on Twitter, <laughs> as of now, at 7.34 on January 7th, that uh, 20, 20 U.S. soldiers had been killed in this attack. Uh, obviously, that's a very preliminary number, mm -hmm. so don't, you know, I'm sure by the time you hear this tomorrow, that will probably be hopefully zero. <laughs> but maybe higher. Yeah. And, and um, so let me tell you how I thought this through. Um, and more and more of what we're going to do here at We Are Libertarians is not tell you what to think. Uh, there's plenty of libertarian podcasters who are great at that. Um, I, think my, I think our best service to you is to teach you how to think about these issues. Uh, I have 20 years of following politics religiously i've worked in it and around it for 15 years at least i've worked in the media most of my career um in politics and journalism um as a reporter and as uh working at a mass media radio show right now uh putting this show together um and reinhold has 78 years of following politics it's and harry harry's very young uh he has 15 um mm -hmm. So almost eight I, decades. I'm, I'm almost getting eight on decades. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's severely old. It's chronic at this point. Um, I think the best thing that we can do with these types of issues that seem very controversial or very big yeah. is to approach it and explain how we thought this through uh, and show our work, show what we're reading, kind of where we're looking for information, how we're looking for information, how we're coming to the conclusions that we're coming to. Because I realized doing this particular episode that the show, and Harry backed me up on this, doing this show is way different than it was in 2013. Post-Trump, since 2016, BT, before Trump, when you'd put a show together, there'd be a standard set of facts. You'd read the New York Times. You'd maybe go look at National Review. You may look at you know, um, think progress or uh, you, you could look at a couple places mm -hmm. and, and everybody would agree on the basic facts, but come to different conclusions. And what I've noticed and, and really saw very clearly with this particular incident is that we no longer even agree on the basic facts. Doing this show is completely different now than when we started doing that. Have you picked up on that, Harry, or do you feel that way? Am I crazy? Yeah. No, you're not crazy because you can pick up two different news articles from two different news sources, and they'll have different facts and say the, yeah. the exact same thing in the same article but claim different things. As Even facts. within the libertarian world. 
Yes. And, and so, you know, Scott Horton, mm -hmm. who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and like you listen to him on Foreign Policy Focus's podcast where he is interviewed about this, and the guy just basically goes on a 50-minute rant with just Islamic names that you may never have heard before, and he just understands it so deeply. And uh, he is very sophisticated, I guess, in, in terms of the depth of his knowledge and what he understands and how he approaches it and how he thinks it through. Mm -hmm. And he basically put out that the number that the Pentagon says their justification for killing the Iranian general is that he killed 500 American soldiers. Well, he studied that and he looked back and he said, no, this isn't true. The IEDs that they're attributing, the, the, the Pentagon's basically saying Soleimani and Iran manufactured these IEDs and they're the ones that killed these soldiers. And so it's that fact is just completely wrong. Well, in the libertarian social media sphere, <laughs> by the time you start to see other people saying that, it it's so watered down that it looks, it, it almost becomes like a weird pro Soleimani argument. You saw this with Venezuela, where you saw some libertarian folks kind of almost sticking up for Maduro. And, and so, you know, there's just a ton of information out there that, that it, it's like, you know, there's conflicting, confusing facts where you have somebody who very articulately lays out their their detailed information, well, by the time you may see that a day or two later on social media, it's morphed into something that is just very confusing and odd and doesn't look right. And so you have to trace back the source and figure out that information. And if you even ask questions, then you're going to get like, you're not a real libertarian. And so in, in all of what we're going to kind of do moving forward is explain kind of how we come to these conclusions and why we think about the way we think so you understand how to do this yourself <laughs> i'm not saying you need to spend 50 hours you're not crazy like i am um you know but i want you to understand the the places that i'm getting my information where i'm looking for for sources how i'm looking for sources kind of the lay of the land so you can then quickly judge if a piece of information that you see on social media makes a damn bit of sense or not, mm -hmm. or where can you start to trace some of that back? It's not going to happen in just this episode. It's something that we're going to kind of concentrate on that we've done a lot of. Um, but the way that I felt that we ought to approach this subject is to open it up to questions. Start with some basic first questions and then get into some of the details with your questions. And so we solicited questions about this event on all of our social media on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and our Facebook group. And uh, we're going to answer your questions. And if we don't answer a question or something raises uh, another question, send me, send me an email at editor at wearelibertarians.com or get in our Facebook group or the Discord and ask the question there. And uh, we will uh, address it next week because we'll probably be, still be talking about this next week. We're going to cover the Afghan papers and some of the lies that have already been told about Iran and what's going on next week. Uh, so what we don't get to today, we'll get to next week. But uh, that's sort of the goal moving forward. So I want to start with just some basic, basic questions, which obviously the first one that a lot of people have is, who is Qasem Soleimani? Now, I am going to butcher every name, <laughs> American, Iraqi, Iranian, uh, ha has anybody heard the correct pronunciation of Qasem Soleimani? I heard Rush Limbaugh call him Salami. Hon <laughs> so honestly, I with that. Yeah, I, I, I've just been going with sal sal Salami, Sulumu. Luckily, uh, like most of the autocorrects and all the keyboards now are picking it up and they know exactly who you are. Yes, and that is the only thing that has not made me look stupid. <laughs> um, yeah. There's an I before yeah, the good. F. I've got plenty of other stuff to do that for me. I don't. I don't need uh -huh. the misspelling. Um, you know? <laughs> so, who was Soleimani? Um, do you want to start, Reinhold? Let's start with you, and then uh, I'll fill in what you, and then Harry, you jump in as well. Who was Qasem Soleimani? Well, he was the 
arguably the number two man in Iran. Um, he's in charge of the uh, Republic forces and the QUDS, CUDS force, um, that have kind of funneled a lot of attention. Their main focus, his main focus has been trying to uh, push their uh, influence over the area, over the region. So, you know, Iraq, Iran, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, they're trying to kind of push out their influence, just like United States has done on the Western Hemisphere. That's what his goal was trying to do in the Middle East. Yeah, right? he, so, was an, he was an Iraqi general who was head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, which is sort of their CIA. And he was not just a CIA head. He was also a Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was also a diplomat, like the Secretary of State. So he was a very important figure, and the Quds Force is broken into various regions, and his main sphere of influence was other Middle Eastern states. And he was started moving up the ranks during the Iraq-Iran War during the, uh, during the 80s, promoted at 23, eventually kind of landed as head of the Afghanistan security sector. And there is a tremendous problem in Iran with Afghan heroin coming into the country. And he did such a skillful job of keeping Afghan heroin out of Iran that he caught everybody's eye and ended up being promoted ultimately. And he's a very good self-promoter mm -hmm. to, to this position. So a very important person in Iran. Right. And he was loved by his, his um, military forces. I mean, they, he would go into battle without battle armor on and he was, he would get them all whipped up and he was really considered the person who kept Iraq from falling under ISIS control. That's like the most recent thing he's had recently. So, um, and we gave him air support during that process, you know, while he was fighting those, those fights, the, uh, the siege to Crete, uh, Fallujah, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was really doing a lot of work there. Um, helping yeah, he protect really, Iraq. He really mastered the strategy of using proxies. And mm -hmm. the way that Iran typically works is the re <clears throat> one question is, why have I not heard of this guy if he's so important? And it's because you, you hear of his work. You hear of the proxies like mm -hmm. uh, Hezbollah. Uh, they fund Hamas a little bit too. Um, some of the some of the Shiite militia, militia groups that work in Iraq, uh, he, he funneled money to those folks. And a lot of what he... So here's the crazy thing about this guy. Like bin Laden, like Saddam Hussein, he was at one time a sort of ally of the United States. So after 9-11 happened, Soleimani is actually one of the people within Iran who advocates for assisting the Northern Alliance in the United States in fighting the Taliban. Now, this was twofold, the keeping the heroin out of the country, but also keeping Pakistani and Sunni um, terrorists and Talibanis from coming into Iran, making sure that those refugees don't get in. So he actually worked with the United States to prop up the Northern Alliance. If you remember the guys on the horseback fighting the the tanks. He was that guy. Um, and so he, he eventually, the United States just did not want to work with them at all. When America then invades Iraq, Soleimani goes to everyone, the Ayatollah and everyone in the IRC, IRG, and says, we've got a huge opportunity to turn Iraq into a client state, just like we've done with Lebanon and Hezbollah. And he then starts funding not only giving cash and weapons to Shiite militia groups, but also uh, schools, building schools, fund, you know, funding roads, jobs programs, and started winning a lot of hearts and minds in a lot of various places. So just like you mentioned, in, in some of these towns like Fallujah, he was uh, instrumental in, in kind of winning over some of those areas. Now, was he the person that we were fighting when you saw the worst fighting in Fallujah? No, not directly. Uh, th those were a lot of Iraqi nationalists. And so uh, Soleimani was a destabilizing force, but he was not the main person 
in Iran through the IRG that we were fighting. It was Iraqi nationalists but and the Ba'ath Party uh, and people loyal to Saddam. But he was very influential in making sure that we never were able to set up a state in Iraq that was ever going to function. The second largest political party is a Shiite-linked uh, group. So I told you guys I had a lot to say. Yeah, yeah. O only a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and, and that's the thing, too, is that he, they were very much – he was very much against the Saddam. So he was fighting – because he had fought against Saddam for all the – you know, during the Iran-Iraq war, right? right? So yeah. they, they were doing everything they could to help get him out, too. But once he's out – then he doesn't want the competition with the United States on the control over Iraq. Right. Hmm. So, so many, uh, to me, you know, like from reading it, it just seems like a, in a different country, in a different sp spot, like if he was in the United States, he would just be a very well, you know, like, uh, but just a very good, you know, community organizer, you know, getting people together, almost that old school style of Democrat that would go through and make sure everyone knows you, you know, you know, he gets the turkeys for, you know, Thanksgiving, that, that type of Democrat, you know. Now, it, Republicans do too. I'm just saying Democrat because, you know, the, the district that I live in. So. You're he's not saying he's Obama. At, yeah, he was yeah. all, yeah, he was. It's Obama with a gun. Yeah, let's go. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, I was thinking more along Jimmy Maida, uh oh. Mad Dog Matus, you know, like a combination maybe of those mm -hmm. two things because mm -hmm. he had the, the love of the army too. So uh, Correct. Yeah, yeah, I see that, yeah. So let's move on to the question of how did he die? Uh, would either one of you like to take this question in terms of how did Soleimani die? Probably screaming. Um, oh, that's, that's yeah. I, I'd had to do it. I would say I that's to. cold, was, but honestly, I waited. Fuck this guy, right? <laughs> right. I, I I waited a beat to see if I was going to do it, and I had to do it. Right. No, the um, he was he was assassinated by a drone. I mean, it wasn't a drone so much as I think it's one of these new missiles that don't necessarily explode to be more impale. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to I'm trying to find out some more details on that, but. Oh, see, I've heard I, saw, I saw the actual video, in it, and it looked like they were putting, like, little laser markers and dropping the bombs yeah. on a convoy. And so he was in Baghdad, and he was heading to the, was at the airport. airport. Yeah, and I think he had been in Syria, and uh, or he had been in meetings in other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question that, that we'll, we'll get is, why was he in Baghdad? There's conflicting reports about that. Uh, the government, the United States government, and, and here's – Here's maybe where I will share our bias and how we approach some of this stuff. Um, I don't view the United States government as us. It certainly does things in my name, mm -hmm. and it certainly uses my money to do what it does, but it does not have my moral support in the things that it does as evidenced by this. And so I, I do not attach patriotism to what the federal government does. I think that's a very dangerous territory. I also try to assume that someone like Soleimani or the Ayatollah or people that are in Iraq or uh, in positions of power like his are rational actors. I reject the notion that because the American government or the American president has declared Soleimani a terrorist, that he is inherently an evil person. Now, is he? In my opinion, absolutely. And this is a person that caused a tremendous amount of death of innocent people and, and probably many Americans as well. But he is uh, he's absolutely a destabilizing, war-mongering person, and the world is probably better off with him dead. <laughs> like, and I'm a little surprised we didn't offer him a position in our government. Uh, right. And we all, but we also view the actions of our government as troubling as well. And so we don't just automatically buy the line that maybe we grew up thinking our government is always right and their government is always wrong because that leads us into dangerous paths of thinking where you end up in Iraq and then 20 years later and a million people dead and uh, thousands of Americans dead, including people that you know from your hometown, like I know from my hometown, like Corey DePew, who died in uh, Afghanistan, actually. 
um, who I went to school with, you know, that, that line of thinking that I had in 2003 of my government is right and their government is wrong and Saddam needs to pay led me to support something that was completely tragic and inappropriate. So what, what we tried to do when we're looking at something like this is not, who is this person and why is this person making the decisions they're making and what, let's put ourselves in that person's shoes. And so this person is a true believer in the Iranian revolution he is somebody that views America's imperialism as uh, a, a tremendous threat towards not just his way of life, but his country and sees the, the bombs that are made by Northrop Grumman and Boeing and American companies falling on um, the people that he supports as a danger and he wants to protect his country. We feel the same way. We feel the same way about about our soldiers being killed by their and so it is it, it takes a, a different mindset to walk away from that to say that an escalation of violence is not necessarily going to lead to peace uh and so so Soleimani was working to in his mind secure his country now is that a legitimate th is that a legitimate thing to you, listener, or to you, Harry, or to you, Reinhold? Well, In my mind, no, because this person, if, if I wouldn't support my government creating war and killing people with bombs, I'm certainly as hell not going to support some other country doing it too. Well, I, I don't support him doing, you know, using war methods to do this because it's just like, you know, if you, if you try to compare it to something that we may be more familiar with, uh, think about the United States with uh, the Sandinistas and Cuba and Contra and the Vietnam and, and Korea and just trying to influence other areas of the country for our safety. He, he was kind of going down that same path, trying to influence absolutely doing his neighbors. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, just imagine if, if uh, some foreign country, say Russia had uh, invaded and took over Mexico. I mean, you don't think that our government is going to go and try and destabilize that they're going to it's not their kind it's not our country it's the neighboring country but it's the same principle right so that's that's kind of how he sees it so he thinks any means necessary to achieve that uh as long as there's no political blow so he's got to be smart about it he doesn't want political blowback and the fact that he was in that position he was in for so long for so many years you know kind of speaks to his success in maneuvering around the politics of all of that right He's an Iranian interventionist, and so for some non-interventionists who are in weird roundabout ways um, kind of supporting this guy <laughs> with their arguments, don't. He was an absolute evil person, and it's perfectly okay to say this person was an evil person. I'm glad he's dead, but I don't support that we're the ones that killed him. Uh, and, and I think that we've kind of lost that, and we should, we should proudly say – there's evil people in the world. It's not our responsibility to be in charge of killing them. Correct. Yeah, because they're, they're still human. There's still, still a loss of life. Right. You know? Yeah. And if we just go around and just start killing people because we dub them as bad, even though they, we know they've done bad things, that's not how our laws work. You know? Yeah. We bring right. people. And, you know. and the other thing, too, is that we're not completely um, free of guilt from all this either. We, it's not like we weren't in there messing around in his country for 70 years oh there goes right home you know judging up history <laughs> we'll get to that in a we'll get to that in a later question right um yeah. i normally think that thomas friedman is the most idiotic of the new york times opinion uh, columnist but he wrote an opinion piece called trump kills iran's most overrated warrior and he took a different perspective that i thought was really interesting uh it, and so he said, one day they may name a street after President Trump in Tehran. Why? Because Trump just ordered the assassination of possibly the dumbest man in Iran and the most overrated strategist in the Middle East, Major General Qasim Soleimani. Think of the miscalculations this guy made. In 2015, the United States and the major European powers agreed to lift virtually all their sanctions on Iran, maybe many dating back to 1979 in return for Iran halting its nuclear weapons program for a mere 15 years, but still maintaining the right to have a peaceful nuclear program. It was a great deal for Iran. Its economy grew by over 12% the next year. And what did Soleimani do with that windfall? 
He and Iran's supreme leader launched an aggressive regional imperial project that made Iran and its proxies the de facto controlling power in Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad, and Sanaa. This freaked out U.S. allies in the Sunni Arab world and Israel, and they pressed the Trump administration to respond. Trump himself was eager to tear up any treaty forged by Obama so that he exited the nuclear deal and imposed oil sanctions on Iran that have now shrunk the Iranian economy by almost 10 percent and sent unemployment over 16 percent. All that for the pleasure of saying that Tehran can call the shots in Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad, and Sanaa? What exactly was second prize? And, and he goes on to talk uh, about many of the other failures of Soleimani and, uh, you know, how Israeli intelligence had fully penetrated his forces and how he was actually a very ineffective person. And so mu much of the media talking about what a military genius this person was and how he was this evil, dangerous person a lot of that is just warmongering, trying to justify after the fact that we killed this guy. And that, there is a lot of that in that we're trying to make him look like something he is not in an effort to justify what the American government has done. And we don't need to do that. We don't need to uh, make excuses for the American government by pretending that this person was, in fact, an evil genius. Was he capable? Absolutely, he was capable. But does that mean that he was the brilliant strategist? Thomas Friedman argued no in this piece, and I thought that that was a very interesting way to put it. Yeah, and there's, there's some truth to that, but there's also understanding that the Iranian people and the people who support him aren't going to look at it quite that way. They're going to see what he's been doing as a success, even though it did scare and kind of um, cause, cause the Western people and Israel to kind of feel uncomfortable. I think a lot of them wanted that. So... Um, the, the other upshot to that too, is that the response that Trump has given has now caused that 15 year window to be over. Mm -hmm. So he didn't, he, you know, he's, he's effectively just not only destroyed our side of it and put sanctions on him, but they also got them to finally just say, we're not part of it anymore either. And we're going to start ramping up our nuclear program, which isn't good for anybody over there. Um, so, I mean, that's whether or not he's, the best strategist or the worst strategist, I, I think it's usually uh, in the middle with, with just about a lot of these things. You, you always get these extreme views of people, the extreme um, characters almost mm -hmm. uh, of people. And, and people aren't that way. People aren't like that. They're, they're trying to do what they think is right. And that's, he was doing what he thought was right. And he was being pressed by the situation and the circumstances he was brought up in and all he had to deal with. Uh, and this is how he chose to respond. I think a lot of what he did was wrong, but I also think that if you don't understand his motivations then you just turn him into um, an evil cartoon character or comic co old comic book villain that never had any background or you, he was just evil. Right. So, um, I just don't see that in this in this uh, situation. Yeah, when you humanize, when you when you let somebody demonize someone, then you kind of let them propagandize you. And if this person is just all evil, then it's justified in killing him. And it doesn't make you examine or question further why or how or should we have done this. Uh, and so you have to really resist, even though this was an evil person who was a bad person. You have to resist just walking away from even considering this even further because he was just a dirtbag. Yeah, correct. And that's why, yeah, that's why all the talking, a lot of the talking heads that are supported, that, that's why they, you know, they harpered on that aspect to keep people on their side. Right. So let's, let's kind of go backwards and let me give you the timeline and answer that question of how did he die? So on December 27th in Kirkuk, Kirkuk, which is way up by Turkey. It's at the very top of Iraq. Uh, if you, uh, there's, there's a lot of history between the United States and Iran. We'll talk a little bit about the 53 coup later on. We're not going to talk a lot about the Iranian nuclear deal. Harry and I have done an episode on that that I'll put in the show notes and you can go back and, and revisit a lot of that because we covered that in depth. Um, but there was uh, uh, let me give you let me give you just kind of um, a backstory before we get to the last week. Okay, 
in in the war on terror, Iran was actually very surprised to hear George Bush declare them part of the nexus of what the axis of evil. Mm-hmm. It was Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. And uh, the the reasoning was that Iran and North Korea use a lot of proxies. They sell a lot of weapons and funnel a lot of money and weapons to people like Hamas and uh, and Hezbollah and our enemies of Israel. Now, in studying for this episode, I read this great book called The Iran Wars, all about the not just the the rising tensions between America, but also the Iran nuclear deal. There was a there was a guy and is a guy named David Wormser. Now David Wormser was the Middle East um, expert for Vice President Dick Cheney, and Wormser in the 80s or 90s wrote a book about how Iran needed to be overthrown. It was it was the great Satan essentially, and many other neocon foreign policy experts bought into this idea of Iran being the, the most evil. These are people who were young and impressionable during the, uh, during the Iran hostage crisis and never really kind of let that go and, and continue to hold it on. Now, if you think that you can't ha- be significant in your government, David Worms wrote a book that was basically self-published. It was published by AEI. Uh, I don't have, I should have written down the name of the book, um, but David Wormser wrote this book. He influenced the right people in intellectual circles in Washington, D.C. He went on to be declared an expert and serve Vice President Dick Cheney. He was in all the rooms after 9-11 talking about the evils of Iran. David Wormser may be single-handedly responsible for the, the coming war that we might have with Iran. Uh, and along with Paul Wolfowitz and, and several other foreign policy experts that pushed us into Iraq, they were, they were heavily at, they were very active in keeping us from working with Iran in any way, shape, or form. Iran is not like when you think of a Middle Eastern country, you think of Saudi Arabia, you think of sand, mm-hmm. you think of poor people, you think of kind of your view of Iraq or uh, Afghanistan. Iran is not that. Iran is a very, modern country with um they're they're persian they're not arab it has a very distinct culture going back many many centuries um and it's it's not your typical arab country it's a shiite country as opposed to a sunni country like 90 percent of muslims are sunni uh and then there's the shiite countries like turkey and iran uh we'll get to that split some other time and so worms are in and uh, several foreign policy experts around Bush really pushed this idea that Iran is uh, as bad. As, they don't ever blame Saudi Arabia, which produced all the 9-11 hijackers. Uh, they blame Iran somehow. Uh, even Mike mm-hmm. Pence, the vice president, this week on Twitter is still pushing the idea that Iran was responsible for 9-11 somehow. Uh, and so the there was... During the Bush administration, the development of a new type of sanctions. And so what they developed was a financial tool that basically said that to have access to the United States banking system, you must not do business with Iran. And so they went to many of the European countries and, and many banks and, and many uh, people who bought products from Iran or bought Iranian oil. They went to companies that supplied, especially Germany. Germany and Iran have a very special relationship, and it's because they both trace their roots back to Aryan blood. Uh, and so most of Tehran was built by Nazis. Uh, so they, they, the United States government at, in the war on terror in the mid-2000s went to countries across the world and said, you're not to do business with Iran at all. And so by now, in 2019, Iran, or 2020, Iran doesn't sell any of its oil, <laughs> barely any of its oil. Uh, America now is energy independent thanks to fracking, but at the time it was very painful for European countries, especially because they relied on Iranian oil. And many, basically we have succeeded in the last 15 years in cutting off Iran from doing business. Not only did we cut off the direct contact, but when Iran, norm, like you would think, went to third party banks, and third-party companies, 
uh, we shut that down too. And so Iran has become increasingly economic, economically isolated through these types of sanctions. We've now done this to China. We've done this to Russia. We've done this to anybody that we are opponents to, North Korea. And so the Obama administration and John Kerry looks at this and says, okay, what, has, what has, have these economic sanctions done for us? Because libertarians believe that sanctions are an act of war. And this is a great example of why. The Obama administration and John Kerry and, and President Obama look at this and they say, what is this getting us? What that got us was Iran moving its financial dependence into arms sales and into less savory. It's just like prohibition, right? Mm -hmm. If you cut off legal sources of revenue, you're now pushing people into the black market. And that's what we did to Iran. And so he said, let's open up diplomatic channels for the first time in 40 years. Let's pay them back for the sanctions, which is what that billion dollars in cash on pallets that we sent to them was for. It was reparations for the sanctions that we placed on them. Uh, and easing those sanctions, which popped their economy, which is what many conservatives now say, they use that income to uh, fund more terrorism, which there may be truth to that. I don't know. Uh, but that's what the Iran nuclear deal that Obama, the JSTOR or whatever it was called, uh, that's what it was about. It was about easing those tensions and building diplomatic channels and, and putting a pressure valve and releasing that pressure valve on a country that we had inflicted a lot of economic pain on. So Donald Trump comes in and says, we're not going to abide by this nuclear agreement anymore. Let's get rid of it. And he, re he puts on what's called maximum pressure onto Iran and we're going to destroy their economy. So we have effectively, and this is how you know that sanctions don't really work. We have had Iran under economic sanctions for about 15 years. We've really destroyed their economy and we've now killed their second in command. And did you see the funeral lines? <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like the idea that maximum pressure really works. Uh, and so s Iran in, in an effort to fight back has started stepping up their uh, attacks on American and Iraqi uh, bases in through their proxies, um, not you know a group a wing of Hezbollah basically carried out several attacks. It wasn't Iran that carried out the attacks directly, but that is their way of fighting back because they view our our maximum pressure campaign under the Trump administration as an act of war. So they're fighting back by firing rockets on our bases. So on tw December 27th in Kirkuk, in the northern part of Iraq, a rocket attack killed an American contractor at an Iraqi military base near the city. Now, this was uh, a Shiite militia that carried out the attack. It was not Iran, but this was a militia that was backed by Iran. So Donald Trump is fuming about this. But he doesn't act. Now, there have been many different things, and including uh, the American and British ships being blown up in the Strait of Hormuz uh, in earlier this year. I know we talked about that. Uh, so Iran has increasingly, under the maximum pressure campaign during Trump, stepped up their, their what's called a kinetic attack, which is basically a fancy word for an act of war. And so they're blowing up ships. They're blowing up bases. So December 27th, there's a rocket attack. December 29th, um, that American contractors killed on the 27th. On the 29th, American airstrikes targeted bases of an Iranian-backed militia, two locations in Syria. So two days later, in response to them attacking us, we attack them uh, in two places in Iraq on the Syrian border. On December 31st, an American embassy was attacked by protesters and was basically overrun by this Iranian-backed militia. Then on January uh, 3rd in Baghdad, Soleimani is killed as he left the airport. Um, so an American drone hit two cars carrying Mr. Soleimani and several offici officials with Iranian-backed militias as they were leaving the Baghdad airport. Uh, so that is how he died. That is a very long explanation of the rising tension. But you need to understand why that rising tension is taking place so that we can then best effectively answer this question, is America safer because he is dead? 
So having heard all that, knowing what you know now, understanding the backstory, I want to ask the two of you, Ryan holds unmuted, so I'll start with him. Do you think America is safer because Soleimani is dead? I, do, I think the uh, United States is not safer. I don't think um, we're any, mu- I don't know. I, I don't know if it's easy to say we're in more danger, uh, but I think that this definitely didn't ease tensions and it didn't really stop anything that was going on. I mean, um, a couple, there were a couple things I wanted to, to kind of go over and what you said uh, that I had heard different stories on. The first one is the, uh, the money that we gave them, that Obama gave them wasn't reparations. It was actually money that was theirs that we had stolen. It was, we had sold Iran some uh, weapons right before the Shah fell and we didn't give them the weapons. We didn't give them the money back. And we have, we've held on to that in a, like a reserve state ever since. And that was the money we gave him was, was supposedly that money uh, that we owed. Um, but, and the other thing was, is that they didn't really overrun the embassy. They, um, they, they kind of walked past the Iraqi guards who let them by. They got to the front guard shack and they overran a couple of the outside buildings, but they never breached the actual embassy compound. They were like they 500 feet. They raise a flag on the American embassy? Uh, no, they didn't raise a flag. They did, they did grab a couple, I think they grabbed a seal from one of the guard stations and they set a couple trailers on fire that were outside that were housing the guards, but they never made it into the entranceway into the actual embassy compound. Right. So, and, and remember when, when Iraq, when Iran has attacked embassies before they've done it with guns, you know, these were Iraqis um, who were upset about the bombings and they were being led by um, some of the militia leaders on the ground in Iraq, right? So they did have backing from the Hezbollah, the, the Quds, you know, that's, that's where they were getting some of their backing, but it wasn't like Soleimani called them up and said, hey, go do this. In fact, when the, the protesters were, were in the middle of their protesting, the leaders of those groups went over and told them to stand down and tried, we're gonna try and do this politically. We're gonna try and get United States out politically. So they backed off and went into camps uh, outside the area and they were going to do like a sit-in and stay there kind of surrounding the embassy and just kind of wait until the political pressure was put on to get them out. One of the people who was responsible for getting them to stand down was in the caravan that Soleimani was killed in and he was killed as well. Hmm. Wah, wah. So it's like, they're not going to be, I mean, it's, it's not just Soleimani who died. It was this other person yeah. whose name I can look up real quick, but, um, uh, Muhammad Al Mahans, I think, but he, um, yeah, Mahans was head of the uh, the Iraq the Iranian militia forces that fight ISIS. Right, and and those were the people who were attacked in that uh, bombing, right? So it was their group. So that's why they were protesting. They were upset about their guys getting shot by the United States. Yeah. Um. So that that's for for Trump to take the 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 leap into going to Iran because he didn't want, I don't think he wanted to go after Iraqis because he's trying to make nice in Iraq. He's still trying to gain influence in Iraq. The United States is still trying to control things that are going on there. Uh, And we're fighting Iraq, Iran for that, um, that privilege as it were. But the Iranians have a lot of power in the parliament now these days. So it, it, they've got a lot more political pull locally on the ground than the United States does because we bungled things so much for so many years. Yeah. So I, I don't see how this helps us in any way. Well, uh, Brian Holt, um, that's where you're mistaken. Um, the United States are so much safer with him dead. Um, we left our freedoms over there, okay? And uh, yeah. it's very close to our freedoms. They're getting our freedoms back. When did Larry get on this channel? <laughs> Listen here, Harry. Get my freedoms. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my freedoms. No, uh, yeah, I'm with Rhino. Like it's if you're in the region, maybe your life is become safer. Maybe, but the 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 I but you know, 
you have destabilized a little different uh, different things because now you've got people who are young with guns and you know with a little liquor dumb things can happen okay <laughs> well and the other thing too is do they think that there wasn't a, a second in command underneath Soleimani? Um, there was. He's already in charge now. He's the one who's probably directed the the missile attack today. So yeah. it's not like you know you you you. The the theory was that if we hit so hard, uh, Iraq will, Iran will just cave. They'll just sit back and go, "Oh, we're so sorry. We didn't mean to do this. We'll back down." And and it's funny because that's the outward appearance of what they're trying to, what the, the policy is supposed to be. But I've also seen, and this is completely off of Iranian TV, mm. uh, but the Iranians have said that they received message from the United States saying, if you don't uh, respond, we'll lift sanctions and we'll, we'll just kind of forget all this ever happened. Hmm. And of course they were saying, we're not going to believe this lies of, of the evil Satan because they always lie to us. We're not the Kurds. So <laughs> they, uh, so they decided that they're going to turn that down. Now, I don't know how accurate that is in any way, shape or form, because it does come from rating TV, take it with a huge grain of salt. Um, but I mean, that's, that's interesting thought process that maybe it's not as, they're not as confident in, in that, um, that they were in. just like they were confident that Turkey wouldn't do anything when we, we backed out of Syria, you know, backed out of that area of Syria where the Kurds were at, that the Turkey was going to stay there. All of a sudden Turkey says, no, we're going in. And then it just seems like another miscalculation. Yeah. yeah SM El Ghani was, uh, po was, uh, appointed head of the Quds force. Right. That day. And he was, yeah, he was, um, his, the right hand man basically for decades. So it's not like he, you know, doesn't know intimately what was going on with, with all this, uh, uh, all the different networks and everything. Right. Correct. Right. Political assassinations have been banned as in America by an executive order since 1976 and largely because they don't work. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's sort of a, a journal, a gentleman's agreement that if you go and you kill a, a Mohandas who, you know, popular mobilization forces is is what I blanked on earlier. They're the the ones that, um, kind of, they're the Shiite backed group. The Shiite backed does not necessarily mean Iran backed, um, but some most often it does. Now, you know, if you're a Mohandas and you're a bigwig in Iraq, or you're Soleimani and you're a bigwig in Iran, and America assassinates them. Not only does the next man up step up, it doesn't abs we, we, we've seen this with ISIS, we've seen this with Al Qaeda. The, the thing that really destroyed Al Qaeda or made it completely shift and change from the, the, the global uh, stretching thing that it was is the fact that we were so far up their butt with surveillance. Hmm. It wasn't that we killed, you know, major. It's not that Soleimani was this mad genius. Part of part of what he was good at was PR, getting his photo taken on battlefields, showing that he was a great warrior, and sending that back to papers at home. So it, and as you heard in the Friedman column, he may not have been a great strategist. And so the next guy up may be a better strategist, or may have a better head, or Correct. understands all the things that he understands. So the idea that this political assassination it wasn't a military assassination let's stop fooling ourselves and conservatives you're just lying to yourselves or us when you try to pretend that this is somehow uh, that he was that there was an imminent threat uh we'll get to the legality and imminent threat in a moment but this was a political assassination because donald trump was pissed off that he turned on fox news and he saw american embassies being overrun and he wants to appear strong he wants to appear like he is doing something. He may even possibly want to get impeachment off the front pages. Um, well, and, th and this isn't anything new from him either. This, when he was running for, for president, he was talking about uh, committing war crimes. Right. You know, let's go after the terrorist families. You know, he let three uh, war criminals walk out of um, getting um, kicked out of the Navy, right? So, I mean, he's, he's on the side of strong military, do whatever we need to do to go in and stop this. Not thinking that 
you know, there are legitimate war crimes that you're committing and you're recommending committing. He's talking about bombing uh, civilian mosques and things like mm-hmm. that now. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah, correct. It, it, there's, there's the nutty thing about it. So, like, the narrative here in the United States was, like, you know, like, the, they killed somebody and they're targeting, like, cultural sites. You know? And it, it was just, and that's just, and it just seemed the jump of was, like, okay, first it was the, you know, the goofy World War Three memes and now it's, like, cultural sites and it, it's it is amazing right for the the awful stuff and impeachable stuff that trump does it they don't do anything that, it, that, threatening to blow up 52 sites is barbaric like not understand like right uh, so yes i listened to ben shapiro today so you didn't have to and Ben Shapiro said that the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, was, quote, tamping down silly rumors that we are going to target cultural sites. The commander in chief said that twice. Like he said it on Twitter. And then when followed up by Maggie Haberman on his plane, he said, I'll absolutely do it. I'll take him out. I'm a madman. Like it wasn't a silly rumor. It's what the guy said. It's like Donald Trump's the most honest politician ever. But you can't What's- believe the word he says. Don't listen to him. <laughs> Yes, it's not like you know, if there had been rumors that they were going to kill Soleimani, they would have said, no, let's tamp down those rumors. That's a war crime. We're not going to be doing that. Well, they did it. Yeah. Um, and what I found funny was that um, Iran was coming out and saying that they were going to only target military organizations and not going after United States citizens. The U.S. people weren't the enemy. Uh, we're going after the military. And somebody posted a tweet that says, uh, cooler heads are prevailing in the Middle East when shuffles papers. Hezbollah is the one who's trying to keep peace and, and it's like <laughs> I had to what happened because the, the <laughs> Ben Salman the, the Saudi prince who's in charge of Saudi Arabia right now mm-hmm. MBS the guy that we, on this very show we were going this guy's a butcher he killed this journalist Khashoggi and it, what a brutal awful thing this is he's the one like going hey uh Mr. President, could you stop that? That that seems really out of line. <laughs> like, <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman's going, "Hey, dude, calm it down a little bit." Saudi Arabia is is horrified by our actions. Like that. So Doug Bandau is a Cato Institute uh, guy who t- writes about foreign policy. The National Interest is a great magazine that I follow. I find a lot of their stuff really interesting, and they're they're like a you know big think tank backed pro interventionist uh group but they have a a blog called the skeptics and what this interventionist magazine did in in the interest of fostering better discussion hired a bunch of non-interventionist people like doug bandow to write for them and so you get a really interesting discussion on foreign policy in the pages of national interest and on their website and Doug Bandow, probably one of the best responses to all this that I've seen, uh, titled Donald Trump's Iran policy comes down to one word, chaos. And uh, so he writes, no one should shed any tears for Suleimani or al Uh Though, ugly truth be told, neither likely killed as many people as the number of people who died as a result of George W. Bush's foolish decision to invade Iraq. But foreign policy is not an appropriate tool for meting out presumed justice, a convenient way to eliminate bad people. There are a lot of evil, harmful, problematic people in the world, too many to turn over to American justice. Moreover, foreign policy must be concerned with consequences. What will the impact be on Americans and other peoples? Unfortunately, the administration apparently thought there would be none, at least nothing negative. Instead, the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo played Pollyanna. The world is a much safer place today, he said on Friday after the strike, and I can assure you that Americans in the region are much safer today after the demise of Qasem Soleimani. Why then did the administration rush another 3,000 troops to Kuwait as a precautionary measure in addition to the 14,000 sent since May? Moreover, why did the State Department send out travel alerts urging Americans to rush home? Quote, due to heightened tensions in Iraq and the region, we urge U.S. citizens to depart Iraq immediately. Due to Iranian-backed militia attacks at the U.S. Embassy compound, all consular operations are suspended. U.S. citizens should not approach the embassy. 
Travelers needing help were told to go to the U.S. consulate in Erbil, the capital of autonomous Kurdistan. So much for everyone being safer. Washington transgressed the usual norms and red lines which governed the occasional violence between adversaries. Countries typically don't target other nations' leaders. One reason is self-preservation. You don't want your adversaries to retaliate against you. More open Western societies probably are more vulnerable than authoritarian ones. And ultimately, there has, has to be someone to negotiate with when the end game is reached. Truly decapitating a government can be as problematic for the winner as the loser. Uh, so this is just a beautifully all-around written article about all of it. Uh, it's in the show notes if you can find it. Just look up the word chaos in the PDF. But uh, yeah, I mean, well, that's, he perfectly articulates why assassination is just a terrible idea. And I think there might be misunderstanding in what that means when they say that his policy is chaos. It's not that the policy is chaos, you know, that they're not sure of what their policy is. That's the chaos. The chaos is that's what they want to sow. They want to sow chaos in the world um, for what it, thinking that people are going to be so scared of what m Trump may do that they're going to sit upright and they're going to do whatever they're told. Right. The yeah. narcissistic personality thinks that he, he, if people fear him, then they'll do what he wants them to do. But Donald Trump doesn't understand that just because he's head of the – this is – he is embodying – and so and we're told so often that Donald Trump is the anti-elite. He's the true champion of the people. But in, in this, he is showing every bit of entitled arrogance that the elite in this country show all the time, that I can do whatever I want. I can act in whatever way I want, and there are no consequences because I'm just richer and smarter and tougher than you. And if, that's just not how that's gonna, this is going to play out. Right. Yeah. Anybody who's got go, go ahead, kids. Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, especially in, this, in a foreign policy game, because if, you know, the idea of him walking to, to remain strong or do different things, the worst thing that can happen to him is he lose an election. People sure. that he's going against, you know, they saw and watched what would happen to Saddam when they got toppled. Trust me, when you were poke any of these tin pot dictators or just someone having a country that, you know, the United States wanted to overthrow, the last thing they want is, you know, one to be hiding in a bunker and there'd be the last moments be on CNN and some funny, funny photos. Yeah. Well, and like I said, I was going to say, anybody who has kids, if you know that if your kid acted anywhere near as close to what Trump does on a daily basis with the bullying and the narcissism and the being just mean to everybody. Threatening you to smack destroy, them around. <laughs> threatening to destroy cultural. And that, that is what horrified so many people in the West about ISIS is mm -hmm. that they went in and destroyed Christian shrines and mm -hmm. even Muslim mm -hmm. shrines and mm -hmm. were throwing people off of buildings. Like Donald Trump was threatening to be the barbarian that like that it like is that really what america is is that what we have elected somebody to represent us as is you're just a you're like at, at the end of the day that's one of the most egregious things not only we'll get to the legality in a moment but one person deciding that he doesn't have to follow the legal rules of not only this country but also the world mm -hmm. uh, and, and the un he doesn't have the rules don't apply to him he can kill anybody he wants without consequences and if you have a problem with it, then I'm just going to wipe your culture off the map. Like that to me is a gut check moment for every single American about who this person is that we have elected president. Well, we, well, you remember when we I went into Iraq, did, yeah. <laughs> I'm, um, when we went into Iraq, one of the biggest knocks on the way we went in was that we didn't protect the, uh, the museum that they had there, right? And all the museum pieces were getting stolen or ripped or destroyed or whatever. I mean, that was how much Americans used to care about that sort of thing. But in this hyper politicized world now, it's just, nobody cares. No, everybody's like, Trump's our guy. We're going to follow him to hell. And we don't care what he, what he does. He, whatever he does is right. Yeah. So how do you, you can't get through to those people. You can't explain to those people because they've given up on any sort of conviction of anything other than following him and doing what he wants. Trump supporters who a week ago were blasting the deep state for spying on their president and you can't trust these people are now telling you that you ought to trust the deep state, the very same people 
<laughs> when they tell you the truth about why this man was assassinated. Think about right. that. Like the moral flexibility that these people have. It, it yeah, doesn't and, make any sense. And it, they ben, keep saying, ben well, Shapiro, Obama did stuff. And like, I'm like, Ben Shapiro is sitting here telling me that it's just rumor mongering to repeat back what the president, the commander in chief said to on Twitter. Like what? <laughs> yeah. The Twitter, the official notice of the uh, tw- 48 hour period of, of the war powers act. Right. Yeah. So it's, that's the funniest thing is he's able to say whatever he wants to under Cause he says it's his personal Twitter. He can say whatever he wants. And now he's going to say it's an official uh, medium for him to communicate with Congress. Now that's just weird. But I mean, we we're seeing now that a, that Trump has bombed, had more drone bombs than um, drone attacks than Obama did. He's killed more civilians than we've ever seen uh, in Afghanistan to the point now that we kill more civilians in Afghanistan than the Taliban do. Mm. Right. And when you try to explain that to Trump supporters, they tell you that's all lies. That doesn't happen. I'm like, these are, you know, third party organizations who are going in and finding this stuff out and reporting on it. This isn't being made up somewhere in the bowels of CNN. This is, well, these ben are Shapiro, people who have done the work. Ben Shapiro's entire podcast today, the hour long podcast was him attacking the New York times and CNN and the messenger. And here's one thing that you can always, that you can always count on. If somebody is attacking the messenger or the media, they know that they really don't have a good argument for what the messenger is saying. Now, now, listen, we have – there is a ton of issues with the media, and like half of the show is explaining that. But you also have to appreciate the other side sometimes when you go, okay, Ben Shapiro has done nothing but hyperbolically call the New York Times an organ for the Iranian government today. I have read half of the articles the Times has put out in the last week trying to prep for the show – it doesn't even come close to what he's saying they are. And, but if you just listen to Ben Shapiro as your news outlet, you think that they're basically just accepting submissions from the Iranian government uh, because he is, he is, he's using sarcasm and humor as a way to mask the fact that he doesn't really have a good point why this is a decent idea. A- and there isn't much about this that makes sense. Because when you look at Iraq, what, uh, what a lot of these protests and unrest that are happening in Iraq right now, you may have seen, you know, Iraq is kind of spinning out of control. A lot of the reason that it was spinning out of control over the last year is a debate over the sovereignty of the Iraqi government. The people who live in Iraq don't feel that they get to determine their future, but they're angry at Iran and Soleimani. They have been angry at the Iranian government for continually interfering in their government's, uh, their their government. And many, uh, the the reason that this this Iraqi parliament uh, motion to ask the United States to leave, it's non-binding, but the reason that it passed is that many pro-United States uh, parliamentarians didn't show up to the vote. And so it carried with barely a quorum with pro-Iranian uh, support. Now, what we did by killing Sol- Soleimani is essentially humiliate the Iraqi government. And so we turned the entire discussion in the country that was concerned about their own sovereignty about the Iranians operating in their country to now the Americans need to go too, which fine by me. Like, if Donald Trump, I don't believe in the 8D chess theory. I don't think that this is his master plan to get the United States to leave. But you, you took people who were mad at, uh, at our adversary and you turned them against us. So it, 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 it took – it made us look worse or as bad as the Iranians. And I don't – in the mind of the regular Iraqi. And I don't think many Americans fully appreciate that, and they need to, because if you're going to pretend that you're the most moral people on the planet, shouldn't you actually live out the thing that you think about yourself? Otherwise, you're just hypocritical. And so the larger diplomatic context to the strike is that the Arab street was completely rocked by this. Netanyahu was disturbed by this. <laughs> the, the 
uh, head of Saudi Arabia was disturbed by this. The head of the Houthi rebels in Yemen, I read an interview with him, and he basically goes, this makes no strategic sense. Like, was this an accident? He literally asked the reporter if this was an accident. Because, and I, and I quote, if this isn't an accident, they're just as stupid as we think they are. They're morons. Like, he, he literally everybody was mystified by this course of action because it is such a big deal to take out the leadership of a sovereign nation on the soil of another sovereign nation is just not done. It is the equivalent of us killing the... Let's say that, you know, the head of the British MI5, the spying agency, is in Canada, and we drone strike his car on his way to the Montreal airport. Mm -hmm. Like, it would, be na it would be international news as well. So you have to understand the larger context of this. And what it's done in Europe, I mean, Pompeo hilariously saying on the Sunday shows this past week, the Europeans haven't been as helpful with this as we expected. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because the United States government just violated every single norm that they helped build over the last 75 years to prevent war. It already was stretched because the Iraqi war was perceived internationally as an illegal war. It was a very thin coalition. Um, you know, the coalition of the willing was a very thin coalition. That coalition is leaving. I saw Romania remove like 15 troops. Um, you know, those people are still there. Those people who signed up, especially the British who signed up to send people to fight in Iraq are just like, dude, what, what the hell? So uh, none of our allies on the ground in Iraq knew about this. You'd think that they maybe want to prepare for their own security. Uh, nobody in Congress knew about this. They made up some phony baloney notification. So if you are in foreign relations, you are a partner of many. And the way that this was handled was very disturbing to many of our allies that, that we are constantly – Donald Trump, for, for, if you're the person that says Barack Obama isolated this nation and ruined our relationship with allies and isolated us from the world, but Donald Trump – Man, he's doing a great job. You're a person that has no intellectual consistency because Donald Trump has taken a lot of what Barack Obama does, did and, and shrink our presence on the world stage. Great. I'm okay with that. All right. But I would prefer if we shrank our presence on the world stage with a very intentional plan and declaring that this is the policy that we're pursuing and this is the philosophical underpinnings why we're pursuing this and everyone in the world get ready, you're going to have to take care of your own security. We are no longer going to provide your security. You will no longer be able to pay, live off of our dime in terms of security. I would rather us be good partners with the world and declare what we're doing. Donald Trump did, isn't doing that. Donald Trump is just looking like a tantruming child with a, a, a toy, and he really lived out this week a lot of what Hillary Clinton, when she raised concerns about him starting another war because he can't have the nuclear codes, I don't know about you two, but like there are non-interventionists, and I get the impulse who sit there and go, look, this guy is the most non-interventionist president ever. He's bringing troops home, he's, but he's not doing it in a way that makes non-interventionism look good, and he's not doing it because there's any sort of philosophical underpinning to it. And forever we will be able to, we will be associated with that kind of chaotic, reckless planning or lack of planning that he is displaying. And he's not even pulling him out too, because he's made very clear that he ain't going anywhere no matter what Iraq tells him. If you think we're leaving Iraq, you're a fool. Yeah. Like, so so the, here's the thing is that he's, he's doing all this stuff, creating martyrs, right? which is why he's done. And now he says that if they retaliate, he's going to up the ante. Where do you go from there? I mean, you, you're taking out the second most powerful person in that country. Do you go after the Ayatollah? Do you nuke them? You know, is that really a possibility that we could be seeing right now is nuclear weapons being used on Iran, right? I, I, I wouldn't put it past him. I, I hope not. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I hope that, that somebody, some cooler heads will prevail on that. Um, 
But when he's been systematically getting rid of anybody who stands up against him for anything, uh, who's left to tell him no? Well, hopefully, uh, what we learn from different documents that there's uh, there are people up there that do tell him no, but each but if they tell him no too much, we know they you know kind of get the, <laughs> they get fired. They get fired, um, you know. So makes you, uh, <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> there's that yeah. but yeah yeah but the whole like and then with with the iraqi government putting out this resolution and the, and if the united states does and when it does um uh, just ignores it it further shows how weak the um the iraqi government really is about doing anything it showed the whole world and everyone who wants who hates them and wants to overthrow them internally because they don't like how the lines are drawn well you know they've got no teeth and you know and they're losing favor with the united states we yeah. just got to build on guns and then we'll just go. Yeah. It's a humiliation of their national sovereignty. And if anybody did yeah. it to us, we would be furious as a nation. Yeah. And you know, Europe's, like you said, Europe's not going to, they were already upset with Trump for a variety of reasons going into this and they cannot be happy about it. Right. So, I mean, there were, there were polls are showing that the, uh, the support that Europe has for this administration is like 20% now, uh, and yeah, but that's gonna I'm, drop. Fuck them. <laughs> yeah, well, but 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 we have to we have to deal with them at some point. Um, this is gonna spill out of the Middle East if it keeps up, and they're the closer ones to it. Yeah, but they're the closer ones to it. They're gonna feel it before we do. They already do. And so, Glenn Beck said this, and I know that invoking Glenn Beck makes people's butthole pucker. But he, I, I've never forgotten this. He said once that. Uh, the fruit vendor in Tunisia who lit himself on fire that began the Arab Spring was the Franz Ferdinand moment. And that we would look back, you know, 50 years later and go, that fruit vendor in Tunisia lit the world on fire and changed everything. And when you think about the Arab Spring in 2012, that has kind of spread everywhere. If you look at what started in Tunisia and went to Libya and went to Egypt and went to uh, Syria and went to now it's in Hong Kong it's in Paris France with the yellow vest it's in Chile it's it's here in the United States in some ways Donald Trump and many of the nationalists who are you know the Marie Le Pen's the Brexit's of the world if you look at what's happening in terms of unrest around the country it started there in the Middle East and Part of the problem, which maybe we should ask the question and move on to it, is will there be another world war? I can't tell you no. Somebody was a little irritated with me that I wouldn't say yes or no to this. And in foreign policy, there's something called the spiral. And it is it essentially is a tit for tat. And you, you have – listen – Escalation leads to mobilization. Mobilization leads to other sides mobilizing. And then all of a sudden, everyone's mobilized against each other. Things are in motion. Things start happening, and things get out of control. You start mobilizing weapons, and the Lusitania sinks. And then all of a sudden, America is drawn into a war. Or there's misinformation, like the, um, the Zimmerman telegram in World War I, uh, you know, there's, there's an escalation of tension, and then all of a sudden Russia mobilizes on Italy, so Germany unleashes the Schlieffen Plan and invades France, and so Britain then invades Germany and fights on the Somme. Like, it, you, you don't know what can happen. So when you look at this specific instance, just this last week, the tit for tat, there's an attack in Kirkuk, so then America fires back, and then they invade an embassy, and then we kill Soleimani. And then they bomb American installations. Well, what does that look like two months from now? And what, what are the uh, regional partners going to do? Uh, so if you're, if you're a Shiite militia person in Syria or uh, in Iraq or Iran or in Yemen, and your, your leader, tactical or spiritual or whatever, has just been murdered, and you know that there are American bases near you, why wouldn't you go attack them? That already happened in Kenya. Was it Kenya? It was in, in Africa in the last couple of days. 
um uh, uh Mogi, no where was that it wasn't kenya it was um the place they always say that libertarians should go to somalia somalia, somalia that's it yeah yeah harry has a a, a base there himself <laughs> um, <laughs> allegedly allegedly yeah and so you don't know where the escalation goes what i think will happen is what happened today iran has to respond they have to look tough uh, their sovereignty has been greatly challenged. You know, when Donald Trump felt that his embassy had been attacked, he had to look tough and fire on Soleimani. And so now they have to do the same to us. And so you, the idea that you would commit an act of violence as a path to peace is just absurdity of the highest order. Uh, there, it just doesn't exist. You can't fire bombs at people and expect them to submit. They just find ways to attack you back, be it the, the ways that Iran will probably attack us, attack us back are through cyber terrorism. They've already hacked one government website in the last few days. Uh, they will attack American installations in the region. They will activate many of their proxies and their cells to fire on bases in those regions. Uh, one person that I talked to today was terrified because she lived down the street from Trump Tower in Chicago. And I just had to say to her, like, I've watched this stuff for 20 years. They're not going to attack Chicago. They're not going to come after Trump. It, 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 now, maybe in Dubai, but probably not in Chicago. You know, the realities of this tipping into a world war in terms of a hot war like you think of in World War II, no. But you do have to stop and ask yourself, what is this? All right? Is this a war? This is asymmetrical warfare. It's war of a different kind than maybe you've ever seen. But your tax money and your name is involved in fighting Iran, and it has been for many years. And so are you okay with that? Are you okay with a president who feels that he can just assassinate the head of another government because he just decides to label him a terrorist? He designated him a terrorist. He designated the military of a foreign country a terrorist organization, and so he can do with another nation whatever he wants without consequences, is that okay? Because the way that you go into a war is slow and deliberative because war affects every area of the society. War is the ultimate destruction of liberty. It, it, think about what has changed in terms of American liberty since the Afghan, since 9-11. Think about our privacy, how much of that has been eroded. Every single text message, every word I am saying into this microphone, every video stream, every Facebook post, every phone call, all of that is captured and stored by the United States government now. And when we found that out, we just kind of shrugged. So when you found out that the president could take up the powers upon himself to just basically start a war with another nation without having Congress declare it, are you going to shrug? So is there a world war in the classic sense? Probably not. Is there going to be a draft? I don't think so, but we are at war. It's an endless forever war that we are fighting in the Middle East, and we have to ask ourselves why, and are you okay with your money being spent on that? I'm not. I'm completely anti-war. We should bring troops across the board in all 190 countries back to America, start shrinking our bases, and the defense of liberty needs to begin by managing our debt and rebuilding our infrastructure and securing every great country, every great civilization, every great, every great civilization comes to an end because their empire becomes too overstretched and their, maybe not their enemies, but their upstart competitors take advantage of that weakness. China right now has something called Belt and Road where they're economically investing in the infrastructure of nations around the world. New Zealand just opted to basically leave the Western Hemisphere and buy into Belt and Road yesterday. What do we offer them? Hey, do you guys need any, uh, like, nuclear weapons to fight Papua New Guinea? <laughs> like, you know, so you really have to start thinking about your position as an American in the world and what we're doing with it and whether or not this is okay. I'm a firm no that the president of the United States, that if he takes an action on another nation's soil against a sovereign nation, 
damn well better get congressional approval, and there ought to be a public debate. At least George W. Bush had the uh, the 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 brain to come and debate it with the society, Harry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very thin veil of like going there and actually bringing up a discussion and then try to get a coalition of the the willing to. Before he went to get his into the Middle East quagmire. You know, yeah, but you know, well. We'll give him credit, though. He actually got congressional approval for what he wanted to do. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I don't see, I didn't see Obama do, you know, Obama tried to get the congressional approval and he got denied that and he just did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Trump didn't even try. Right. Because he doesn't think he has to. He thinks he's got the power to do it. And according to all the, the documentations and the laws and everything I've read, he does not have the authorization to be doing this. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And that would probably be like the only really good thing that comes out of it is that you finally got all these people who actually are paying attention and there's like, wait a minute, he can do that? Well, no, he can't do that and he shouldn't be able And even if he could do that, he shouldn't be able to do something like that. Yeah. The problem is, is that's never going to pass now. I mean, Congress can right now get the, and they're doing that. I, I know that the Democrats are trying to put together a curtailing of his power. They're going to get it through the House, but the Senate won't take it up. And even if it did, even if for some reason the Senate decided to pass it, um, because it's full of Republicans, they're just going to do whatever Trump says, as we've seen with the impeachment. So even if they were to pass it, Trump would just uh, veto it. And then what are you going to do? You get enough to override the veto? He doesn't. I mean, he's got enough people in his pocket in the Senate to ensure that he can do whatever he wants to do right now. And at some point we have to ask, if this is what we want, and if it's not what we want, we have to tell those senators who are giving him a blank check to do whatever he wants to do, they're going to lose their jobs. So if we keep sending those people back, if we keep saying that this is okay, it's just going to continuously get worse. I see so many people defending this by saying, well, you know, all these other presidents have done the same thing. I'm like, well, not this. I mean, <laughs> let's, let's not be crazy. It hasn't gone this far. Uh, but they all have done things. They've all done things to push the line a little further. And until we stop that push, it's going to continue going. And by defending it because other people did it, then you're defending their actions doing it too. So if you say, well, I'm, I'm defending Trump because Obama didn't get stopped when he did it. Well, then you're, you're reversed uh, approving what he did because right. you're defending Trump for the same thing. So you have to, you know, we have to stop and say, is this what we want? And, and I just see there's too many people in this country who aren't, who are okay with it. Who just say, yep, that's what we want. I mean, at the very least, pick up the phone and call your representatives. I mean, that's the least you can do. It's probably the, the best thing. Like what you have to remember is politicians are spineless weasels. They really are. The other thing that you can do is start running for local office because if you, if you didn't catch the Mike Pence episode that we just aired, that book piety and power is a great example of how somebody works their way up to the vice presidency. Yeah. You know, they, they work their network here in town and build their name ID. And, you know, I know people, I know so many people who knew Mike Pence when he worked in radio, you know, and he, it, that's why I'm always challenging Rob Kendall, because if Rob Kendall ever becomes president, at least there was one libertarian challenging that guy. You know, Mike Pence adopted several libertarian ideas from Rupert Bonham's gubernatorial campaign that we ran against him. Uh, if you can knock out local politicians, especially young ambition, ambitious ones that have horrible ideas because you ran a campaign to knock them out or to at least challenge them in a week in their position – then maybe they don't get promoted. Mm -hmm. uh, pay attention to your local politics because they're the people who are tomorrow the congressman who are then the senator then or the vice president or the president. Um, yeah. So any final thoughts, Harry, before we move on to the next thing? I was going to say uh, the when it comes to the other presidents because they bring up you know, I'm just going to bring up the simple fact that at least Clinton, when he wanted to bomb people, he at least did it to American citizens. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, still, never mind. I'm, I was going to. Is that too soon? Is that still too soon? I was going to make a Waco joke, but. Yeah. 
Yeah, do a Ruby Ridge one. That's better. I got to leave memes on the internet. That's all I'm saying. Um, let's answer some listener questions. Uh, we've got several pages of questions here. We've, we've covered a lot of this, so I won't uh, belabor it. Um, so Brian asked if others will just take over, or was he planning these supposed attacks on his own? And, and I found that a lot of people are confused because when the government says that he killed 500 people, like they view him as Rambo with a Bowie knife out in the field. Well, no, he was, uh, he was a general. He was a strategist. So it's like saying George W. Bush is responsible for the death of a million people in Iraq. That's true, but he didn't go over there with an AK-47 himself. Uh, and personally, I, I, it, it really became a standard in the Nuremberg trials. We should hold military members and politicians who are in charge of the military personally reliable and responsible for the deaths that they cause because just following orders isn't a good enough justification for the loss of life. And so as society has started to hold military and a political, the political and military class of, of societies personally liable for deaths, lo and behold, war has gotten a lot nicer. <laughs> like drone warfare is basically how it's done now. Um, because these people don't want to go to prison themselves for war crimes. But, of course, if you commit war crimes, then Donald Trump will pardon you. Um, but boy, is that guy a piece of shit. Oof, uh, yes. the, if you read what his fellow soldiers say about the guy that Trump pardoned who committed the war crimes, man, what a monster. Um, what, what, what was he doing in Baghdad in the first place? And, th and Tyler asks, and Thaddeus says, was he really brokering a peace deal with the Saudis? What's that about? Uh, so there have been a couple reports. I've heard that uh, Soleimani was in Baghdad on his way. He was meeting with some militia members, which obviously they were in the car with him. Uh, and he was planning an attack. And uh, that, that is the administration's line. They say that it, it, the attack was imminent. And so they can legally get away with this if they can say that, you know, this it was an imminent attack. Well, They've been trying to assassinate Pompeo, the defense, the head of the State Department, has basically been encouraging for a year uh, Donald Trump to, to kill this guy. And so what's your definition of eminent? Is your definition of eminent the guy is on a street and he's four blocks away from walking in with a, a C2 exploded, exploding on his back? Or is eminent uh, three months from now and he's planning to uh, blow up something? So. The idea that he was imminently about to commit an atrocity when he has a long history, a uh, 40-year career, basically, of this stuff, it just doesn't really hold water. The, and so you really have to define what is your definition of eminent. And a lot of people's definition of eminent strikes uh, for American security is minutes or hours, not weeks or years, uh, as the Trump administration seems to think. Um, the... Prime Minister of Iraq said that he was there because the head of Saudi Arabia, MBS, reached out to the Prime Minister of Iraq and asked if uh, they would help negotiate, begin negotiating a peaceful settlement between Iran. There, 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 is, there is basically a three-way war for control of the Middle East. It is Saudi Arabia and the Sunni uh, wing. Uh, it is the Shia in Iran and the Turks, who are Shia themselves, but uh, various other ethnic groups as well. Um, and they've been competing for control of the region. And so apparently, according to the Iraqi prime minister, uh, Saudi Arabia was seeking to, pe to find a peaceful settlement with Iran. And uh, he was there to have a conversation with the Iraqi prime minister, who would then take that back to Saudi Arabia. Um, obviously, if that is true, that is off the table. We have to ask ourselves when we're reading this kind of stuff. I saw the great Sheldon Richard, Richmond uh, at the Libertarian Institute write this as if it were gospel. And I have to ask um, if I don't trust my own president and what he says or my own CIA or my own Defense Department, why should I just take as gospel the words of the Iraqi president or prime minister or, or the Iraqi army or the Iranian army? And so sometimes I think in our haste to try and make the case that our government is bad, 
we end up giving favorable uh, coverage to people who we don't know if the Iraqi prime minister is telling the truth. He's a government official in Iraq, like known for corruption. So I, I can't – now, Mike Pompeo says that's absolutely not true. He was not there to – there was no peace negotiations going on. Uh, but Mike, Mike Pompeo is I – can, I can tell you with certainty that Mike Pompeo is less truthful than the Iraqi prime minister, and I don't know the Iraqi prime minister. Uh, well, the Iraqi prime minister is also the one who wrote up the, the declaration of removal of United States forces. Yeah. So when they were talking about would the, would the uh, prime minister sign it, it's like, well, he's the one that wrote it. So it's probably a good idea that he might sign it, right? So, he's also the first Iraqi prime minister from the Shia sects, sect. Not S mm -hmm. E X, but S E C T E S. Yeah. Well, and that's uh, the other thing too is all these people who are trying, who are in the parliament now, who are Iran backed, they're people who were fighting against. Who, they were being brutalized under Saddam. I mean, they basically Saddam said that you, those parties couldn't exist. If you're a member of those parties, you were going to be tortured, and they were. Um, so they're trying to. You know, there are a lot of people in Iraq who have just been hiding underground that are coming out now saying, this is what we believe, this is what we want. You know, this idea that Iraq is all, you know, Sunni and, you know, it. there's a lot of different sects and people that live in that country, right? So yeah. uh, we arbitrarily created those countries over there out of the Persian Empire. So, you know, we drew those lines. We didn't really care or... When I say we, I mean, it was the European powers and the United States as well after World War II. But we, we just kind of created those countries without paying attention or caring about their cultural population or anything like that. It Start, starts with Sykes Peacock, and I think we covered this in the uh, World War I podcast and the maybe the Iranian deal podcast. But at the end of World War I, World War I basically killed the Ottoman Empire, which was where many of these lands were made up. And so British, Italian, and uh, French, and the victors in World War I basically carved up the Ottoman Empire and drew out countries like Iraq. And, you know, the British got Iraq, and the French got Iran, and the French got Lebanon, and the Italians got this. And so Iraq basically never should have been drawn the way that it was. It contained three distinct major ethnic groups as opposed to creating three countries. They created one country that was just – always going to create destabilization it was literally just old rich white men who not, knew nothing about the area on a map drawing out what they wanted and so yeah, right and and we saw a lot of that at the end of world war one a lot of really bad treaties were made yeah. right clean you know it, it's like so much of what we're dealing with today came out of the aftermath of world war one because people were trying to be still colonial and doing whatever they wanted to do and um, we fought I, when United States was in Iraq and trying to prevent a civil war. That, to me, was like the the craziest thing ever. Is because we're they need to have one because they really should be three countries. Let them figure out what their country should look like. Why are we trying to tell them they have to be one country? Who says that that's the way it has to be? You know, that's it made no sense to me on why we were doing that. And that's why I was just like, we should have been out of there. As soon as, as soon as that fell and they found Saddam hiding in his little hole, we should have been on planes and out and said, good luck and figure it out. And uh, we just decided not to do that that way. And that's the bad decisions, again, that we keep making. Uh, I interrupt this to bring you a report from the uh, Ali Arouzi, who is the NBC News Tehran Bureau Chief and Correspondent. And... He's reporting, uh, let's see, uh, let me go back. Iranian officials now posting Iranian flag, a sign of battle. IRGC reporting that a second wave of missiles has been launched. Uh, IRGC is saying Ayatollah Khomeini is in control center coordinating attacks. Iranian Air Force has been deployed. This is all over the last hour on his Twitter. Iran is warning that if is there is any retaliation for the two waves of the attack, they launch their third wave, uh, and they will destroy Dubai and Haifa, which are 
completely separate countries than Iraq. Uh, state media reporting Iranian fighter jets have entered Iraqi airspace. Iran saying that if there is no retaliation from America for these latest attacks, then they will stop attacking. But if America attacks, then their response will be crushing and widespread. Iran state media saying none of their ballistic missiles were intercepted. They hit all their targets. Iraqi Shia militias under Iran's patronage are saying that they have launched their operations against U.S. presence in Iraq. How this unfolds now depends on the U.S.'s response. Iranian state media is saying that IRGC has readied all of its underground missile depots. They're reporting that they are full battle ready. Uh, so obviously chilling stuff from the NBC. Uh, if you want to follow that Twitter, it is A L I. A-R-O-U-Z-I. Uh, Ali Arzui. I'm sorry. I listen, man. Uh, I need to put in the for anybody. <laughs> well, uh, th- I, guess, I guess they didn't sit down and shut up as uh, Trump thought they would, did they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Rob, our buddy Rob Kendall wants to know, how many Americans and American soldiers are dead because of him? Honest, non-Trump sucks answers only, please. Listen, I can tell you that the fact that the Pentagon is putting out that he is responsible for 500 deaths is false. And you can see the documentation by going to antiwar.org, I believe it is, or com or Libertarian Institute and looking at Scott Horton's article on it. It's in our show notes and our links, but there, the truth is maybe he's responsible for more than 500 deaths. Okay. If he's the person that we, we don't, totally know what his role is how much money or weapons he funneled to opponents he was fighting on our side against isis so you know it's we were fighting against him in syria we were fighting against his forces in iraq we were fighting with his forces in afghanistan and so this is a person that we had uh he, he was an opportunist, just as we are opportunists. If it suits our interest, if it suited his interest, then he would fund with those groups. That's exactly what we've done. And as soon as those groups have stopped suiting our needs, we turned on them. And he's a victim of that. Uh, so we don't, I don't know how many people this guy, his, how many deaths he's responsible for. I think it's irrelevant. I think he was the head of a, a military apparatus of a foreign nation, and he should not have been assassinated because that is an act of war and it should not have happened on a uh, sovereign nation soil because that's an act of war against Iraq as well. Mm-hmm. Let's say he killed, he, he killed 10,000 Americans, uh, declare war on Iran for killing 10,000 of our people. And then we'll go, we'll do it the way that the constitution has outlined because that's the way that a free society goes to war. You don't just tiptoe into it or spiral into it the way that we're doing it with this. Yeah, at least it, you could say that Trump isn't uh, isn't as concerned about that as even Bush was. And we all know how we feel about you know President Bush, but like I said, he went out and he got the approvals yeah. before he did this stuff. Why couldn't right. Trump do that? All Trump had to do is go and say, hey, this happened, and he had, probably would have had the support to get it passed. Uh, but by taking this action, now he's ensured that he won't get that support. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions that are kind of similar. Chuck asks, after he was killed, they talked about him like he was the highest profile terrorist on the planet. Most of us follow the news very closely, and I don't recall hearing anything about him. And Tom said, the Trump administration says he is a terrorist and is behind killing many of our soldiers. How long have we known about this guy, and how, how long has he been killing our people? And why is this only now a problem? Um yeah, so that's part of the problem with the American media and its uh, dependence on uh, the, the military-industrial complex's money. If you go and look at WTOP, which is one of the, I think, the highest billing radio station in the country. It's a news talk station in Washington, D.C. All of their ad buys are military contractors. Like, the place is just funded by it. Um, there is, it's, it, it, it's not expressly said in the corporate press, it's not, it's nothing having worked in the corporate press, my whole career and around it, like nobody comes to you and says like, Hey, change your news coverage because these people are big sponsors or connected to this. It's more like, 
you're just smart enough to put the dots together, right? Uh, you don't, you, you know, if you want to go for that kind of journalism, go right for the interceptor democracy now. Okay, pal, go to truthdig.com. Uh, so the reason that he is the greatest terrorist on earth is that America and its state run media and its state run organs as much as you'd like to think that CNN and the Washington Post and the New York Times are fully independent of the government, they're really not. They're, they're all kind of swimming in the same pool. And so there's, there's still Americans writing for those newspapers. And so they, are, they feel a need to kind of cover their ass. And, and, and frankly, the news business is just kind of, um, you know, in that, in that Lo Bianco interview, I tried to really talk to this investigative reporter who wrote this book about how do they work like give you a sense of like what's what's the popular story that everybody's talking about right well it's Soleimani like we've not right. covered this guy on the show here Harry but because right. everybody's talking about it we want to give you the context to the news so I think that's also part of it yeah and it it is it is how quickly just just almost just like um it's the difference from 9-11, right, is that uh, Osama bin Laden had, uh, has been mentioned, was at least mentioned before, at least in the early 90s. You know, like some people knew he was a little nerdy. This is different. This is like, but, you know, this person, everyone just keeps bringing it up, hard pronounced name, you know, and in, in a region that most people cannot find on a map. Jay Solomon, who wrote that book, The Iran War, he, he was one of the first people to write an article about Soleimani. And that was in the 2000s. That was in the late 2000s, maybe early 2010s when he wrote yeah. that article. He was the, probably the first for Western journalist to write about this guy. Well, and, right. And, and I don't trust any of this, be not, you know, in the presence of not the deep state, but the military industrial complex. If you've never read Scott Horton's Fool's Aaron and you just looked at the, the lead up to the war or just read any of the cables, the blatant lines that get put out there. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's well, like. Also. I was saying, don't forget Operation Mockingbird. Yeah, we explain that. So, so Operation Mockingbird was a CIA organization plan that uh, they would embed CIA agents into the news media. Uh, they would get them jobs as reporters. They'd get them jobs on editorial boards, uh, but they were all CIA. Uh, so they were using that as a way to change the stories for their propaganda purposes. Um. People say that this isn't going on anymore. Um, I, I, I doubt that, <laughs> uh, that that's not going on anymore. Uh, but considering that we've now lifted the, the laws that were, so they put some laws in place uh, that came out of the discovery of this, that the, the government could not propagandize American citizens. Um, and then that law was quietly uh, shelved during the Obama administration. So now it's legal. You can do it just fine. So um, I'm sure that it's uh, just no longer happening anymore. <laughs> just go, just go look up Project Mockingbird uh, and the, go down that rabbit hole. Um, so. Yeah, while you're at it, look up Operation Ajax. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> check that one out too. We didn't even get to that. Uh, how does classifying the IRG as a terrorist group affect killing a foreign leader? Uh, frankly, we just made up the, their terrorist organization because we say so. Um, I, I think it's. Well, I, I, always, I always thought that it was bizarre that we would put a foreign nation's military on there. Like I get uh, putting on a, a non-attached group like Al Qaeda or Al Nusra on there, but how do you put an entire nation's military on that? Uh, what, I, what, what I liked was reading a, a Wikipedia article that had changed to say that. Um, they're a terrorist organization as identified by Japan. So I, Japan called them a, a terrorist organization. So therefore, you know, we can buy that now because they don't want to leave it as the United States said it because that becomes pretty obviously self-serving. Um, it's just like everybody complains about the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, overreacting to all these people and claiming that they're this and that and everything else. And it's like, how is that any different? You know, look at what's going on and then to make that determination yourself. But um, what do you call a terrorist organization? Is it an organization that bombs civilians or um, you go into a wedding, you know, 
how many weddings have the United States bombed in the past 10 years uh, in Afghanistan? Anthony it's, asks, so if Colombian officials are in the U.S., can they assassinate someone from Honduras that they have declared a terrorist? So let's say Honduras has declared Colombia a terrorist organization and someone from the Honduran, Honduran embassy walks over to the Colombian embassy and just assassinates a, a visiting military dignity. No, they cannot do that. Uh, but that's exactly what we did. Um, so it, it would violate international law and the sovereignty of the United States and as, as well as Colombia. Uh, there are supposed to be just like a physical fight. You are not supposed to just have a physical fight if you're a married couple. You go to counseling. You work it out. You find intermediaries to work out your differences and settle disputes. That was the point of the UN. And, and it, it, listen... I'm not going to say that the UN does a damn thing except take our, take our money, okay? But that was, that was the, the noble idea of the UN. It just didn't end up working that way. Um, by the way, the United States violated international law, and Pompeo wouldn't let Zarif, the um, uh, foreign minister of uh, Iran, uh, into the country to go to the UN to talk to the Security Council about this action, and they barred him from entering uh, the United States, which Ben Shapiro thought was a good idea. But the fact is, is that when we built the United Nations here, A, nobody thought, well, this is their idea, the United States, who would ever block somebody? And the United States will never act poorly. Uh, little did we ever think that the United States <laughs> would act in a way that the Security Council ought to get involved. Uh, but Zarif wanted to come and file a protest. But we have an agreement with the UN that every foreign diplomat is allowed to visit the UN and allowed to enter the country to go and uh, perform their duties to the United Nations. And we violated that part of the agreement with the United Nations. Um, why, why does the news fail to mention the airstrikes across Iraq that preci precipitated the embassy takeover? They make it seem like it was a spontaneous incident and not retribution for airstrikes. Well, Russ, I think that that is just partially, uh, it was mentioned, it's just not on the front page. So you got to go to the world section of the website to see it. And I think a lot of us just kind of consume news on social media. Um, Jeremy asked, what was Salami's connection to Biden? Why were they so buddy-buddy and why was he in the White House in 2012 rubbing elbows with Obama? Uh, I tried to look this up and I did not find an instance where uh, so, where Salami was able to visit the White House. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that anywhere. I tried to fact check the, that, and I did not find an instance where the uh, where he came to the White House. He he did not that I can see. There was a picture of um, what was his name, the Abu Mahdi Mohandas had visited the White House as part of because you know he was in Iraq. Uh, general and and uh, part of the Iraq militia so I think he had visited the White House at one point I think that's where they're getting confused because he was killed too during the assassination so I think that's where some of that is coming from and it's um, a lot of people are, are making up some stories too as well I mean there was somebody who put out a picture of supposedly of uh, um, Obama in a picture you know, like next to each other with, uh, they were trying to say it was Soleimani, but it wasn't, it was somebody else. And then that was even a Photoshop picture because the original picture was actually some uh, um, Indian diplomat from years ago. So it, it's just like, people are just doing all kinds of crazy things and everybody's believing it. Nobody's filtering this stuff through and saying, hey, wait a minute, let me check this out. It's like you said, if you, as much research as you've done, and a lot of the looking into it that I've done and neither one of us has found any evidence of it, then where are they getting it at? You, you can go look at the seven pages of links in 10 space type that, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, I, I never saw it. Uh, I did see exactly what you're talking about where that Iranian official was here, but, uh, you know, I, I can't verify that. Uh, so Iraqi official. Iraqi, yeah. What would, uh, Christina asked, what would a libertarian do when the U.S. and Americans get attacked by Iran? At what point is it okay to fire back? Well, we have to ask, our, ask ourselves, uh, if this person did kill 500 Americans, where did those murders take place? 
Was it in San Francisco? Was it in Indianapolis? Was it in Cleveland? Or was it in Kirkuk? Was it in Tikrit? Was it in Baghdad? Why are American military men in these places? Mm -hmm. Okay, So we have to ask ourselves, where are these attacks taking place and why? And right, and these just look up these the are military fights. Just look at yeah, you look up the um, uh, and that's what the embedded as much as Vice is just turned into like a disgusting website. Yeah, former from, shell. For yeah, former shell of itself. But about three or four years ago, they they did embedded journalism in a lot of these areas, and you got to actually see like what are our troops doing on the HBO version of Vice, mm -hmm. which some of that stuff, some of the military episodes of Vice where you like you get to see basically what our troops see, you you have a better perspective of what they're doing. Um so libertarians first of all would bring troops home and close these bases down. You may have seen the meme, if not go to our Instagram to look at it, of how dare Iran attack attack our bases. And it's pictures of American flags and all the places where we have bases on the Afghan and Iraqi border surrounding Iran. And so the reason that we have bases in 170 or 180 countries is because it's a forward operating position. And so the reason that we would never really invade Iran is that it would be a multitude of the force that we needed to invade Iraq. What was the force to invade Iraq? Was it 180,000? The initial the initial push was probably about that, but it, that was after weeks of just carpet bombing and carpet bombing. And, yeah, the shock and, and all. Yeah, Iran's a little bit of a different animal when it comes to it's very mountain the way it's made. Yeah, it, it's, it's a, more like Afghanistan. How long have we been fighting in Afghanistan? Right. I mean, it's. Uh, Russia took a hit. Everybody's tried to invade Afghanistan over the past hundred, couple hundred years, and have all failed. It's like attacking uh, a high position. The only way yeah. to really invade Ara Iran is to go through the way that Saddam failed to do so is to go through the southern marshy section. You can't go through the mountains. You can't go through the desert. If you went through Afghanistan, you'd end up over mountains and then right into a desert. It just it wouldn't work. You couldn't ever get to Tehran. So boots on the ground are never going to be an option. Nor could you ever fill the bases in that particular area? So there's not going to be an on-the-ground uh, war there. But would there be a proxy war or an on-the-ground war between Iran like in Iraq like there was in Syria? Absolutely, that could possibly happen. Um, so uh, how would libertarians uh, take an attack? Um, there's wars that are just and there are wars that are not just. And I know that with all due respect to our pacifist friend, Ryan Lindsay, who runs Wall Reader, uh, he, he doesn't view any war as just. And that is his position. And, and I fully understand and appreciate that position. I look at things like if we're attacked on 9-11, yes, there were actions that we took that precipitated 9-11. We have that same mentality of history started on 9-11 and nothing happened that caused us to be attacked in our mind. But there were reasons that we were attacked. Um, but it was perfectly justifiable for us to send F-16s to destroy training centers in Afghanistan. Um, it, and that, to me, is a perfectly just military action. Invading Iraq, which had no participation in 9-11 whatsoever, was never a just war. It was. It never. There's no justification in my mind for the Iraq War whatsoever. Full stop. Uh, it was an unjust war, and people say, "Well, why are we still in Iraq?" And I honestly can't tell you because I don't know why we went to Iraq in the first place. Uh, so, um, not most libertarians are not pacifists. If we are attacked, they will defend the homeland. They will fight back. But we would We would massively shrink our footprint. So it would make the opportunity for Iran to use proxies to invade our military bases. There wouldn't be bases or American soldiers being killed tonight, murdered by Iranian rockets, because those bases wouldn't be open anymore. Um, does the military allow drafted soldiers to make memes while enlisted? Well, uh, I don't know. I can I, answer that. Uh, yeah, you were in the military. Yeah, I was in the military. Uh, no. <laughs> yes, 
Um, there's that. There's actually there are some rules now around social media that I've been out of the out of the military long before there was social media. Uh, but there are some rules around things that you can and can't do on social media uh, while you're in the military. Uh, so it depends on the memes and what you're saying. And uh, as long as it's not related to the military or your position, you know, where you're at in, in the military, I think you can get away with it. But, um, you know, if you're making memes with cats, you know, that's, that's yeah. probably cool. Right. So you, there are, there are some limits there to what you can do with the UCMJ. Now, this is the portion where I start asking questions from the big Facebook page. Those very thoughtful questions came from my personal page and the, and the We Are Libertarians group. Now, thanks to Harry called Walnuts, the Walnuts. Yay, Walnuts. W-A-L Nuts, uh, which you can join if you go to wearelibertarians.com. Uh, so, Harry, uh, you know, we haven't gone to a lot, and you, uh, I like when Harry is ready to interrupt. He's very polite, so he doesn't interrupt like me and Reinhold. He kind of goes, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 uh. So, Harry, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a few of these questions to you. Uh, uh, Steve asks, why do Democrats treat a terrorist better than Americans he killed? Um, well... <sighs> Two th two parters for me. Uh, one, <laughs> orange band bad. Okay, orange band bad. Two, th it's that last bit. It's the 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 gasping of the anti-war left. It's still there. They're just very quiet, and you know we're so happy that they're still here and willing to finally have a backbone and speak up. Welcome back. You know, libertarians will will just say like we we're here keeping the fires warming. Thank That's you, thank right. You. Uh, now, Ace wants to know, Harry, when Salami was torturing and raping protesters, did the Democrats invite Jeffrey Epstein? Oh, um, let's see. Um, that would be a question mostly for for Tad, because Tad probably Tad. was on the Tad was probably at the parties, but oh, so, <laughs> but I don't know. I, you know, I think the 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 biggest takeaway there is Epstein didn't kill himself, so. Yeah. Just go with that. Uh, let's go to our resident communist, uh, Reinhold, and ask him this question from Gregory. Why do libertarians keep suggesting that Trump wants war with Iran, even though he has clearly stated otherwise? Also, why is it every time there is something to do with the military, libertarians spew the same leftist propaganda as CNN? What do you say for yourself? Uh, well, the first part, what was it? The um, Trump says he doesn't want war with Iran. Trump has said he wants war with Iran. He doesn't want war with Iran. He wants to play golf. He doesn't want to play golf. Um, how many thousands and thousands and thousands of lies has he told? This is part of the problem with why I think a lot of people have a problem with the, the amount of lying he does. It's not, and it's not just the lying. It's, it's the lying about things that are easily easy to look up and verify that he gets wrong. And it, it's, how do you trust him to say anything at this point? How can you trust anything he says? Right. Right. So he's, he said that he wants to pull all the troops out of Iraq. Well, here's your chance. They're asking you to leave. Oh no, I'm not going to do that. Well, then do you really want to pull him out of Iraq? What are you just saying that because you're a populist who wants to get uh, public uh, sentiment on your side and you feel like it's, it might swing this way if you, if you act strong. Um, as for, the liberals and the CNN and all of that stuff. Well, you know, CNN is the, the bastion of the, of the progressive liberals. So, I mean, that's, they, they write the talking points for them. Right. So what are you can do? All right. Um, this final question uh, goes to both of you. What incidents, what incident started their hatred towards America? Uh, I'll start. This is a never ending <laughs> question. Just start with one thing and work your way backwards and you may never like we've covered it in, maybe not directly in a couple different ways in this episode. But let's start with the fact that we just created their countries, uh, the Western world, the colonialists uh, at the end of World War One just created their country without really consulting them and drew l contentious lines um, the, the those European countries then exploited their resources and uh, saddled them with mega debt through things like the World Bank and and took their oil and resources. Uh, then instituted coups in the in these countries that 
uh, destabilized and, and disrupted their sovereignty. Uh, we have continually invaded their countries and, and uh, killed their people. I mean, where does it end? I mean, maybe talk a little bit shortly about, uh, and I know you're going to have a Patreon bonus episode on this, but Operation Ajax. I mean, it started in 1953 when Mosaddegh, the democratically elected uh, uh, prime minister, was ousted to install the Shah of Iran, who was connected to the British and the Americans, and Operation Ajax is a CIA operation that we apologized for. The United States government, I think it was, was it under Clinton, formally apologized for overthrowing their government in 1953. And we still have people saying it didn't happen, that it's all propaganda, right? So they were going to, uh, they had had a, a rise up of the people because they were saying, hey, why is British Petroleum over here taking all of our oil and we're not getting anything out of it? So they got together and created this new government and elected a person to be in charge of it. And he was saying that they're going to uh, nationalize all the oil companies that were in the country and potentially start selling some of it to Russia, uh, which the United States and, and Britain couldn't handle. So we overthrew them and put, in, uh, put the Shah in. And the Shah spent decades... Um, trying to do reforms and make the country better and make it more Western and increase their economy. But in doing so, he also completely squashed every person who was against him. There was a, um, a report that in 75, he had between 40,000 and 100,000 people dissidents executed, right? He made it so there was only one party. Anybody who had any dissent or anything else was to shut up and or die. Uh, so they got kind of upset about that. And it finally pushed to the point where uh, they had enough power. And I just found out that part of that, that the Shaw found out he had cancer and didn't tell anybody, even the CIA didn't know. And he became despondent and, and kind of quit defending himself. And that's when the, uh, the, the, the Ayatollah and the, and the, the religious people who had been fighting for some sort of say in the government for years uh, finally had a chance to rise up and they ended up overthrowing him. And we instituted that Shaw that we were the ones who defended him for so long. And then when Jimmy Carter allowed him to come to the United States for cancer treatment, uh, he ended up dying in, in Egypt from the cancer. But um, when he made that decision that angered uh, Iran even more. Because uh, they 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 were afraid we were going to try and put him back in office, um, so that's when the two embassy attacks happened. The first one happened was only a two hour long attack uh, takeover around February, and then later in the year is when the uh, the big one happened that lasted for over a year. So that's kind of where that all started from. But a lot of people think that it all started in seventy nine with the uh, with the Islamic Revolution and and the takeover of the embassy and it's like no they were they were brutalized because we had put the shaw in um in power and defended him for decades now uh fun let's wrap up with a couple questions for harry uh i added a sticker on instagram uh we have like 13 14 000 instagram followers most of them are 13 year old boys i wish i were kidding uh, so <laughs> Harry, they want to know, why are you gay, and why did your mom have gender reassignment surgery, and is she disappointed in you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Classic. I am not gay. I know I have ever been gay. Uh, <laughs> and, not uh, even once. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that. Not right. There's nothing wrong <laughs> with being gay, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just not gay, you know. Real uh, weak, real uh, Reinhold. The real weak defense of his gayness. I'm just saying. Yeah, I just don't well, buy it. I think I think it's. Uh, well, the thing positive. is, like, the thing is, it's just, just not, you know, like, uh, just not gay. You know, like a possibly 51st century uh, man. You know, you know, sometimes you just got to be flexible on how you dance when you're traveling about the stars. That's why I tell everybody, you know, you just got to get on. over yourselves. Turn on the light. But, but who? Turn on the white the... filter while you say this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would take about 10 minutes. Uh, but what about all the traps? 
What are, what's wrong with traps? Are they gay? <laughs> are traps is, gay? Is loving a trap gay? See, that's a that's a hard question. Uh, See, we had such a respectable podcast. We've ruined it. We've got off of this. If anybody's um, listened this to the the end of this and was thinking they were going to get some great insight at the end, oh man, there's sorry. Just, <laughs> uh, let's let's start wrapping up. I am out of gas, and uh, I want to go turn on Sky News or RT or anything but an American cable news. <laughs> see what's going on. Al- go Al Jazeera. You'll get the Al right Jazeera. Thing, so. You're right. They're not on Pluto TV. Uh, oh, okay. But you know what is on Pluto TV? <laughs> TV land drama, which has Walker, Texas Ranger. And so at least <laughs> once a week, I turn on and catch up with the old uh, Chuck Norris. So uh, final thoughts for this episode, Harry, you get to lead the dance on the moon stars or whatever. I get to lead the dance. That's right. great. All right. Uh, first things first, what I want to, what I want to bring up is uh, like I said, if you're going to live into the 51st century, you've got to be a little more flexible on who you dance with. Second thing is, um, well, <laughs> second thing is I wanted to bring up is when you're going, um, if you get tired of all this, you know, like foreign policy stuff and and all the funny names of the and the pe- and the people who don't, you know, look like you but they have weird names. Go ahead and pick up a go on YouTube and look at the new ContraPoints video. Natalie Wynn of ContraPoints just put out a brand new video on canceling. Yes, it's in an over hour video. Watch it. It is amazingly put together. Um, it's all about cancel culture. It is, it, you know, like you have the hour to listen to it. Get on a, uh, you know, get on, get on the treadmill, put it on, walk, walk for the hour. You will enjoy yourself. Trust me. Uh, let's see. Uh, third thing with all this, uh, j- just be careful. Uh, we talked about this in a, a low key wall episode about like articles and stuff like this. Sometimes coming out like this is when you see an article and it, you know, if, especially if it tells you everything that you want to hear, try to get three independent sources or three other people saying the exact same thing. It helps, you know, so you know you at least got some semblance of a fact. Uh, be careful of news stories that you know give you the conclusion instead of letting you inform that on your own. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, are you done? You just kind of dropped off there. I was. I didn't want to interrupt you. Always try to interrupt me. No, I I know you're like it's like you know you always had that friend in high school that if you raised your hand too quick he'd flinch a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's like poor, poor Harry. It has a verbal flinching. Uh, he's like, and then think for yourself. <laughs> well, well, a lot of it is like I just don't want to be like accused of talking over people. You know, you're gonna I mean, if listen. It's new rules. If if Reinhold's going to join, he won't be with us every single week, but mm-hmm. you know he's going to be with us a lot. You're going to have to speak up. I feel bad that you haven't gotten – I mean, I want to make sure that you get your points out, so you're going to have to wedge in there. I do like the verbal tick, and this is just one of the be- drawbacks of doing it on Zoom. If we do it on Zoom, you have to – you kind of have to do what you're doing, you know, or maybe wave because the way that we post the video is I'm the only one on screen, so, but I can see the two of you. The, the viewer can't. Uh, but when we're in person, you know, you kind of people have cues, they lean up to the mic, they kind of look at you, they get ready, their mouths purse a little bit, you know, and I, I, I'm, I read every cue. I'm what's called a highly sensitive person. So I pick up every social cue imaginable and exhaust me all the time. Um, but that doesn't quite take place on Zoom, you know, so, you know, if, if you're going to get the luxury of staying home, uh, you could just interrupt, man, just go, Reinhold, get, hold on a second. You know, you 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 have seniority. He you're ahead of him in terms of oh, yeah. time. You know, you want to talk. You tell him to shut up. <laughs> yeah, but I like uh, but I like I, I like the stuff that Reinhold says. You know, it's just uh, and there's too much of it. Then we need more Harry. Here's what right. I'm gonna say. Get in the get in the Discord if you want Harry to talk more. And ask Carrie, are you okay? Why aren't you talking enough? <laughs> so many people messaged me. I got a text from some stranger. I have no idea who this number is. And they, I just got a random text out of the blue, mm-hmm. which is not okay. Uh, but I'll accept it uh, because they're clearly a wall fan. Um, hey, man, are you okay? 
I've heard things have been going bad with Harry lately. I saw that he hasn't been on the show in a while. Hold out hope, though. I'm sure he'll come around. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very good troll. Many people asked you, did you get a lot of messages asking if everything was okay between us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got, a, I got, a, I got some. I got some. Um, my favorite was the uh, is a. Uh, is some of the ones from um when it was doomcat no everybody else is in the discord if you miss some of those just get on the discord and some of those are real, actually kind of funny or when um <laughs> or when people jumped into the uh like into like voice chats and asked me about it like i was gaming and stuff like that those were fun too i i'm weirded out because your little ai creature has like one eye closed and the other eye is rolling into the back of her head <laughs> and so it's like talking to Harry as an attractive female who's having an orgasm. <laughs> I'm, re- I'm both turned on and terrified that I'm turned on right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Reinhold, final thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I guess I don't have too much more to add than what we've already talked about. I mean, there's, we could go for another four hours on this, I'm sure. And uh, in the old days of um, the old uh, low-key wall, we might have done that oh, <laughs> yeah. before we were told to tone it down. Yeah, this uh, is a two and a half hour, <laughs> almost two and a half hour episode. We, I mean, we really don't go over ninety minutes very often. So this is this yeah. is quite a. And, we, and we're and we're hardly through a lot of the the real meat data. You know, I mean, we 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 touched on it as best we could. But we're going to need to do another show, I'm sure. And I don't think the situation is going to disappear off the, the news. So we'll probably be able to do something about that more in the coming weeks. But I want to talk um, a little bit about propaganda uh, and yeah. the Afghan papers next week. I mean, I think as, as we kind of work, work our way through this, uh, I'm going to take a book on the plane that it's like almost like a comic book. But I, I bought some books on propaganda and I uh, got a couple about the Iraq war Um so I'm going to read those and just kind of refresh my memory on 2003 mm-hmm. because so many arguments right now are the same. They're like the same arguments. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been going on about propaganda for some time now. Um, so, yeah, we definitely can get into that. Um, but really what I want a lot of people just to take away from and uh, everybody's drawing up sides and saying, oh, if you're, uh, if you're happy that he died, then you're evil. Crap and if you're... Man. Uh, if you if you're trying to defend them, then you're you know a terrorist <laughs> sympathizer. It's like why why are we doing that? I mean, people you understand that there's there's a lot of motivations going on here on a lot of different sides, and not everybody's 100 percent right, and not everybody's 100 percent wrong. We've done a lot of stuff. Uh, they've done a lot of stuff that's wrong. Um, and if we don't start having some kind of empathy for what everybody in the situation is dealing with. We're never going to be able to come to a situation where we can have an, uh, a good end to the hostilities. It's just going to keep ramping up and ramping up until one side is completely decimated. And, and that's just not, it's not how I think things should be. I think things should be more of a case of understanding that other people, you know, why are we telling people in Iran and Iraq how to run their countries? Where do we get off saying that? You know, I mean, I don't want them telling us how to run ours. So why do we think it's okay for us to do that there? Um, so just, yeah. I don't well, know. I mean, the, the reality is that if you, it, how do you change something if you don't admit that there are faults? And mm-hmm. so conservatives, especially in pro-military sympathizers, uh, will, will accuse you of being anti-American for having a, a for, for pointing out that our government lies to us. Well, there's a lot of examples of that and in the and the people who are in charge lying to us like and I don't just mean like Donald like I think Donald Trump I don't know if Donald Trump even lies I think Donald Trump may just believe what he says at all times and has no ability to like I think he just says what he doesn't have a filter it's like that's true to him at that moment like whereas Pompeo will spin and you know say things that aren't true and uh, like you know, like Donald Trump to me is like in a different level than the Afghan papers where they're knowingly deceiving the public. Like, I think Donald Trump's just a bullshitter. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and what I, what I think is insidious, 
yeah, that's bad. But I also like just kind of like he's like your dad's golfing buddy to me. It's like, yeah, yeah he's insane. He's just going to say crazy things. But what's insidious is when you go back and watch Ken Burns Vietnam and you hear John Kennedy say, there's no way we're going to win in Vietnam, but I can't get out of it. I got to win my next election. And then 10 years later, 50,000 lives later, an American soldier's millions of mm-hmm. Vietnamese, mm. like that's knowingly lying to the public, the Pentagon papers, the Afghan paper, like, well, that's, that's the scary thing about all the time. Yeah, this is the scary thing about Trump is that he does just whatever comes off top of the head. And the problem I find is that he's almost never well informed on what he's talking about. He is right. every you know, radio caller I ever took. Like he's when, a when we were, do you remember when he went on Fox News to try and talk about the uh, the Biden conspiracy and the and the uh, you know uh, the server and all that stuff in Ukraine? And even the Fox News hosts were like, "Are you sure about that?" Because he was just, <laughs> and they would ask him. He said, "Well, that's that's what they say." So he's just getting information <laughs> from from Giuliani and his guys saying this stuff. He's like, "Well, that's what they tell me. That's what they say." Who you know? It's he's not even getting the information and and critically thinking about it he's just regurgitating whatever conspiracy theory he's heard that day uh, all and right, he's well, the one in charge of making these decisions now and that's the scary really scary <laughs> part of it just rolling dice <laughs> all right let's wrap it up thank you so much for joining us we will see you next week uh if you're in san francisco come and see me uh if you've never listened to the pat down please go check it out it's very funny uh, we, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Please email us, editor at wearelibertarians.com. That is the best way to con- converse with us. You can also hit us up in the DMs. You can send me a personal message on Facebook or, uh, hey, if there's a question that you didn't have answered, get in the Facebook group. There's a ton of smart people in there. Let's start a conversation. You see an interesting article that you think that we should talk about or that you think other people should see um let's let's really get that facebook group going get in there talk if you see a funny meme share that too but uh yeah this is all about conversation and getting you talking and thinking with other people that uh are curious like yourself and we'd love for you to join the discord or the facebook group go to we libertarians.com and you can find all those links and uh, please you're a fan if you made it this far share this with people the best way that we can grow this podcast, the best way that we can get people to start thinking like we think and to understand what you have come to understand is to share information. You never knew about the Operation Ajax coup in 1953. And then you became a libertarian and you went, whoa, this is wild. This is what? Uh, this is, you, you didn't know about the sanctions tightening in, in Iran and why they make the decisions that they might make. Share this information with people. It's incredibly powerful. One of the best ways to share this is go on Spotify, subscribe to us on Spotify, take an episode, hit the share button, choose Instagram stories. It'll pop over to your Instagram automatically and ask people to play it, listen to it, tag us, tag our Instagram. Uh, That is a great way to share any podcast that you love. Share it on Facebook, share it in an email, or just, uh, you know, Make your wife listen in the car uh, if you carpool. I know that we've had people when they carpool, they force people to listen. Or we've even had people. This is how autistic some of our listeners are. They, they literally turn the speakers on in the office, turn it up, and make the entire office listen to us. Can you imagine? A, that is commitment to the libertarian cause and also why we curse a lot less on the show. <laughs> uh, so... I don't know if I should enable you to do that, but we're doing our best. So thank you to everybody who uh, listens. We really do appreciate it. And we will see you next week. Thank you so much. And uh, hey, pray for everybody who is a soldier or a contractor or anybody who is in Iraq or in that Middle Eastern theater. Um, mm-hmm. Please make sure that you uh, that you think about them and pray for them because it is – they're sitting ducks. And it is not their fault. The yes, they signed up, but uh, you know, Donald Trump made this decision, and the decision of one man has put the lives of a lot of people at risk. And so, make sure that they're in your thoughts and prayers. All right, thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next week.